This video is part of a study series titled Biblical Salvation Settled Once and for All. Please see the playlist link in the video description. Uh, hello again and welcome back. We're now on our study of John 15 in this series and I'm sorry that it's taken me so long to uh, do this. Uh, it's a very challenging chapter and it's took quite a long time to prepare for it. So in this study uh, we're going to be looking at John 15, particularly the meaning of um, abide in me, continuing where we left off from John chapter 14. And this is a very difficult passage. It requires very careful study. Uh, unfortunately, this this will be a very long study just because there's so much to, to unpack. So please do use the video chapters and maybe watch this study in several sittings if you need to. And, and do take breaks and, and keep your mind sharp uh, just because that there's so much to unpack uh, from this study. So um, suppose you were to have a debate about salvation issues, right? And as a rule, let's just say you could only use the gospel of John in the debate. So obviously, as somebody who believes in eternal security, I would probably go to John chapter 6 or John chapter 10 to uh, justify, you know, interminable everlasting life. Um, whereas a conditional security advocate would probably go to John 15 as, as their go-to um, proof text. And it's used as one of their strongest passages, actually, for the doctrine of losing uh, salvation because normally when they quote verses they usually just quote mining individual verses and when we go to those passages it seems the context is very different from what they're trying to quote usually but this is one where they actually have a passage rather than just one verse so it requires a lot of careful study it's a very difficult chapter in in the bible as well um it's you know a lot of people struggle with it i think and so that's why this is going to be such a long study and why it's taken so long to do this because there's, there's so much prep to, to unpack what this passage is really talking about and this study still won't really cover absolutely everything um so, you know, do do uh, pay close attention and do watch it in bits as well. Um, and do pop in the comments if you think that there's anything that I've uh, missed from this as well. So it's it's quite important to get the context behind this dialogue that Jesus has with his disciples. So I would encourage you, if you haven't seen it already, to see my study video earlier in this series on John chapter 13 and John chapter 14. Because between 13 to 16, this is one long conversation. And so if you haven't seen my previous material, you get to this study. It will seem as if I'm making a few important claims without backing them up, you know, such as the definition of commandments, for example, because I have already offered my justification for that in, in a previous study. So, um, as I explained previously, I will avoid delving too deep into Holy Spirit related issues because I think that really needs its own study with. with 14 to 16 in mind rather than trying to blend it in with everything else so we're just going to stick with non-holy spirit related issues in this study okay so let's let, let's quickly recap some important points from our study of john 14 because this then sets the context of understanding john 15 as well so remember that jesus is talking to his closest disciples he's not talking to the multitude of jews not even believers generally, this is a very personalised and intimate conversation with the faithful eleven. Consequently, it's a very difficult passage to understand, and even the disciples, I think, didn't fully grasp what Jesus was actually saying in some verses. And so we, we do need to make some allowances. If you disagree with me on some of the stuff that I say about this passage, or if I disagree with some of the stuff that you might have about this passage we do need to make some allowance because it is such a difficult part of the bible and even the disciples couldn't fully understand it so with our recap in mind one of the things that we explored in john 14 was that the commandments in this chapter what are they because a lot of people hear the word keep my commandments and they automatically associate it with turning from sins of the flesh but if you remember from the previous study jesus doesn't talk about sins of the flesh in this conversation he isn't warning his disciples about sins of the flesh in this conversation he's exhorting his disciples to be comforted be of good cheer do not let your hearts be troubled believe that i am in the father and the father in me love one another as i have loved you and continue in my love ask anything in my name and i will give it and bear witness of me and even though Jesus's other commandments about fleshly sin issues for us are only a few page flips behind in the Bible, for the disciples, some of these teachings would have been months ago or years ago. And so they wouldn't necessarily, when, when they were hearing this conversation, automatically associate his commandments with those 
teachings from several months ago. And fleshly sins wasn't really where the disciples, or even in fact many of the Jews for that matter, really stumbled. And so what we picked up uh, from the previous study then was how John himself in his epistles uh, picked up these same themes. And if you remember, we were pointing to what Jesus said in, and then pointing to what John said that was similar. And um, although John's first epistle does mention sin frequently in a very generalised, non-specific way, the epistle doesn't really talk about sins of the flesh, doesn't go on to name all of these different kinds of sins. Rather, his writing suggests that the antithesis of loving God and keeping his commandments is those who don't abide in the doctrine. Crucially, that Jesus did not come in the flesh. This is the, the type of antichrist that he describes uh, in both epistles. And so that really sets the premise of how John interpreted the conversation that he had with Jesus. So, so when Jesus did uh, talk about, you know, keeping my commandments, it, it wasn't about whether every single Christian is pulling his own weight in, you know, turning his life around and cleaning up his life, but rather it's about continuing in, in the teachings and doctrines of Jesus and in his absence, being no longer there to direct the disciples, love one another the same as I have loved you. And as things are brought to your remembrance, pass those teachings and testimonies on to others and continue in the belief that you have of me, but, but strengthen it with a, a confident and an unwavering belief. And secondly, as well, uh, another thing that was picked out from our study is that this passage is an encouragement not really a dire warning because a lot of legalists treat John 14 to 16 as kind of like a warning passage about the dire consequences of not continuing and not obeying and you know but the thing is actually everything that Jesus said in this conversation is really meant to be an encouragement to the disciples not a terrifying warning because if you think about it you know Jesus comforts his disciples he offers the Holy Spirit to be the comforter in his absence Jesus leaves them with peace and says, let not your heart be, hearts be troubled. And Jesus will do the things that they ask in his name and he goes to prepare a place for them in heaven. So there's a lot of really encouraging themes that are being picked on uh, from John chapter 14 and 15. It, it's not really a dire, you know, hellfire kind of a warning, really. So although uh, we'll be more focused on the earlier verses in this chapter, and I'm not going to be able to cover the entire chapter in one sitting but I think some of the stuff at the end of chapter 15 probably makes more sense to group it with chapter 16 really anyway so we're going to read a little bit ahead I'm going to read up to verse 16 uh, just to give you a more holistic understanding of what Jesus is talking about but the first sort of 11 12 verses where, where we'll we'll focus particularly on you know the earlier the verses the more we'll, we'll focus on them really so starting at verse 1 Jesus says I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of my Father in my name, he may give it to you. So just a few introductory notes then. Um, some people have noted that this passage is quite similar to the grafting uh, in the olive tree analogy in Romans chapter 11 because we have a similar idea that you can be in the tree and you can be cut off just as you can be in the vine in John 15 and cut off but unlike the grafting analogy in Romans 11 in John 15 we actually start with the premise that you are 
already a branch in Christ. This passage does not tell you how you become a branch in, in the first place, or even what exactly it actually means to be a branch in Christ in the first place. So we'll really need to carefully consider what that actually means. So when he says abide in me or abide in my love or abide in this, abide in that, abide means to continue, to remain, to stay in, such as uh, sometimes the Bible talks about abiding in somebody's house for a few days or abiding in a particular location or an inn or something like that. So we have a premise that you can be a branch that is in Christ, whatever that means, and if you don't continue in Christ, again, whatever that means, you can be cut off and therefore no longer be in Christ. Again, whatever that means. Now, um, as a side note, in this passage, abide looks indefinite, abide forever and ever and ever, but the word itself technically isn't always indefinite. So, for example, abide till you depart from that place, or there abide and thence depart. Today I must abide at you. So sometimes abide can be a temporary word but obviously most people would agree that the implication of this passage is that it does mean to abide forever. So this passage as many of you will know is used as one of the strongest proof texts that you can lose your salvation because you, you can be in Christ and you can be cut off right. So people who believe in eternal security then um, how would we answer this and that, that's obviously the interesting question. Now to some extent you see we could argue that this passage is not talking about eternal life or salvation because it doesn't use a lot of salvific terminology such as eternal life or salvation um, and normally this is a, a credible argument as I've pointed out in the last study because when we try and justify eternal security from John chapter 6 or John chapter 10 we're calling upon a passage that passages that actually talk about eternal life Whereas John 15 does not, at least not specifically or explicitly. And this is the problem is that conditional security and work salvation, they often have to run to passages that aren't actually necessarily talking about eternal life at the expense of the passages that are. That being said, though, so despite what I have just said, and that's why this is such a difficult passage... John's gospel was written with the purpose that the reader would have eternal life, you know, if you take the gospel as a whole. So we can't completely ignore the context of eternal life either. And many people would argue that being a branch in Christ does assume having eternal life anyway. Otherwise, what on earth could that possibly even mean, right? So, you know, if, if that doesn't mean somebody who's saved, then what does being a branch in Christ actually mean then? And are we kind of negating its meaning if it, if it means something different? So, be, because this is such a challenging chapter, there are so many different interpretations of this passage. Some of them overlap, each having their own various merits and shortcomings. So, if I were to oversimplify, I could categorise most interpretations probably under one of these three. Okay, so perspective number one, conditional security, that this passage refers to somebody who was saved, does not continue in Christ, whether that be faith or works, depending on who you talk to, and is cut off, a.k.a they lose their salvation, right? That's it. So conditional security, you know, a lot of them would use this passage. Now, the perspective number two, eternal security, is that this passage refers to somebody who started their journey in the faith, but did not continue. And so because of the all-knowingness of God, if you like, they were consequently never saved to begin with. So um, now Calvinists obviously may insist as well that this includes continuing in the works and the perseverance, not not just faith itself, whereas obviously in free grace we, we wouldn't really advocate or insist upon that. The third perspective, and a lot of people actually who do believe in eternal security do take this view about this passage, is the disqualification view. Well, they, they wouldn't call it that, I'm calling it that, but that this passage refers to somebody who has been kicked out of church or disqualified in ministry or is sorely being chastised in the flesh by God, possibly even to the point of death, because of really serious sin or disobedience or still technically saved, but, you know, maybe not useful for God. And so casting in this regard into the fire is kind of a fire indignation or being called home. It, it does not refer to hellfire. And I've, I've heard this uh, likened to, uh, I heard a preacher once liken it to the firing of a useless employee, essentially. So that view, the third perspective, removes any eternal life connotations out of the chapter.
Now, there are other perspectives, but you could maybe put those as kind of subsets under the, the three perspectives that I uh, previously mentioned. So, perspective number four, going home, that this passage sort of refers to a believer that has become unfruitful, and God needs to call them home to heaven. Quite similar to the disqualification view, I suppose. Um, perspective number five, lift me up, um, that a believer has been so downtrodden by the devil that they need God to pick them up again. This is You'll find out why so soon, but this is called the Joseph Prince view, as I'm going to call it. Um, perspective number six, joy, that being filled with God's joy and knowing that God's love you, uh, that God loves you is the meaning of this passage. And if you don't know this or you don't have this joy, it, it could be because you don't have um, eternal life or you don't have life. Or, or, or sometimes they won't always mean that you don't have life, but they, you're missing something, essentially. And then perspective number seven, and I've, I've heard Steve Lawson say it this way, um, tr that it means the true Christ, that staying in the true vine, as opposed to many of the false vines that are out there, such as, you know, in Jesus' time, apostate Israel. So um, there may be other perspectives because it is just such a challenging passage and it, and it wouldn't be feasible for me to cover all of them. But that they're roughly the ones that I, I tend to to have heard by the most famous preachers or the ones that I've heard the most in a nutshell. Now obviously this whole video is going to be dedicated to me explaining what my interpretation is but I'll give you a bit of a spoiler alert here that I do believe there is a salvific aspect of this chapter certainly I think it'd be very difficult to run away from that but I think salvation and eternal life is really more of a subset of what it's really talking about rather than the main point. And I do also think that you can apply this passage allegorically to other teaching points, such as the disqualification of a useless believer. But I think that's purely allegorical. I don't think that's the main purpose of this teaching. And I don't think that's exactly what Christ was trying to convey to his disciples. So when we understand the, the whole story of the Gospels, Christ is kind of handing over the baton, so to speak, to the disciples. And, you know, he's going to leave them. He's going to go to his death. They're a little bit discomforted by this. And so he needs to comfort them, give them a confident faith in who he is and ensure that they continue in everything that he's taught them, particularly in relation to what the truth is, generally speaking. And so the disciples need to continue in his words, continue in his sayings, stay rooted in who Christ is, despite the obstacles that are going to come their way and despite some of the discomfort and the sorrow that they're going to face. And following that, because whereas up to now Christ has led them, but there's going to be 11 disciples to, to share the leadership, then he wants them to love one another in the same way that Christ has loved them. You know, not trying to take preeminence over one and each other or being the best of the disciples. So to abide in Christ then is to hold on to his words, hold on to his doctrines, and this is how Christ sustains us. And if a man doesn't hold on to them, he, he won't bring forth fruit in the due season of which salvation is a part of that fruit and i am going to explain all this and so if he doesn't continue then he must be cut off because he's a burden to the vine itself and, and the other branches so that's kind of uh, how i'm going to um ex explain this i apologize if uh, what i've just said to you um seems very new to you um I, you know i don't like to be that guy that comes up with his own weird interpretations that nobody else has because there's eno enough of them on youtube already uh, yeah, I will try to defend my points as much as I can. But the thing is, this is a very challenging chapter, okay? Most people who cover this chapter, from what I've seen, only really have short sermonettes or very short explanations about this chapter. Some of them complete teach complete nonsense from this passage, making absolutely no sense whatsoever, Joseph Prince being one of them. There are some longer sermons, but I find that those sermons are often littered with a lot of filler where they're just talking about a lot of other things like gardening in general or other passages in the bible or they talk about nothing for much of the talking time and go off in various tangents when exercising very little actual sermon time talking about the passage itself so even a whole sermon could contain little more than 15 minute explanations doing only the surface level tappings into this chapter as a whole because they just go off in these tangents and bang on about gardening for about 20 minutes um 
I have heard a sermon preaching preached on this chapter using interpretation through the disqualification viewpoint, and I do think it was a very good sermon, and the preacher made some good points, but I think you have to glaze over certain details if you make that your main interpretation. And I found that really I didn't understand this chapter much more after the sermon than before, even though it, it was a good sermon, okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through these interpretations, uh, well, these perspectives, and give you some of the the merits and the shortcomings of each one, uh, and why I don't sort of fit in any, you know, particular one. So perspective number one, conditional security, that John 15 basically means you can lose your salvation. So uh, that's how a lot of people interpret this passage. So this doctrine presupposes that a branch in Christ is somebody who is saved, has eternal, you know, has eternal life, and so to be cut off in verse six is to be cut off from this life, cut off from everlasting life. They lose their salvation. Now, conditional security advocates almost always, without question, have some sort of a works-based salvation in there somewhere. So they will usually say that as well as continuing in your belief about who Jesus is and what he has done, you also have to continue in your works of obedience, okay? Because if, if you don't, you fall into the James 2 dustbin. So um, the reason why they reach this conclusion is obvious, is that uh, Sam, uh, John 15, 1 to 6, is sandwiched between if you will love me, keep my commandments from John 14 15 and if you keep my commandments you shall abide in in my love that's later in verse 10 of uh, John 15. So what are the merits of this interpretation where does it come from well the branches are in Christ quote unquote okay and so this is then applied to mean having eternal life because we can see from other verses in the Bible that being in Christ is interchangeable with having everlasting life so like John 5 26 son to have life in himself uh, eternal life in uh, John six fifty six dwells in me and I in him uh, you've got second Timothy 1 1 life which is in Christ Jesus uh, Romans six twenty three. now in the King James it says eternal life through Christ Jesus but some translations say in so obviously somebody using one of those translations would would use this verse as well and then 1 John 5 11 to 12 that this life is in his son so obviously we've got these various passages that eternal life is in Christ and so obviously you can understand why they will make that bridge with uh, John chapter 15 here and also as well, um, later in, in the chapter, abiding in Christ, or more specifically in his love, is, is tied with the commandments. And naturally, as we had to expose in the previous study, a lot of work salvation folk, that they, they, they're filtering their minds at these marginal notes and theologians' commentary. So that when it when it goes in saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, it works its way around the filter and all the you know theological commentary gets wrapped around it. And that turns itself into turn from all the, your sins that thou shalt be saved. Because, you know, that, that's often how their mind retranslates what the Bible actually says. So there are a few things going on here. Even though the eternal security go-to passage in John chapter 6 and 10 actually mention eternal life, the conditional security go-to passage in John doesn't, at least not directly, okay? So they are standing on sandy ground when they have to use a passage that doesn't mention eternal life verbatim and make it about eternal life and then wrestle against passages and explain those away when they do mention eternal life. Having said that, to play the devil's advocate as the saying goes they can easily demonstrate that being in christ has a clear connection to eternal life from other ver eternal life verses okay we can't really dispute that right so for this reason we, we cannot just completely ignore or dismiss this passage to win an argument against them either we, we have to be able to address this passage with eternal life in mind a key focus on abiding in christ here appears to be about commandments as the explicit the requirement for abiding in his love rather than faith since this word does not appear in john 15 and although the word believe was used a few times in john 14 not in the context of eternal life necessarily although that's arguably an aspect of it that's now suddenly stopped because uh, you know in, in john 15 we're moving away from that so obviously when you look at the passage superficially it looks more commandment orientated or more obedience orientated rather than faith orientated and obviously you know they're going to be kicking and screaming if we start word swapping and just say it just means to believe well we we need to be explain why he uses the word commandments if that's what it actually means so uh you know we we did unpack that in the previous study there was what the commandments actually entail um, in you know in this passage <laughs> 
So this is just a, a brief summary of how they interpret this passage. So, um, sorry, I don't know why I've put it twice there. So being cast into the fire in verse 6 must mean hellfire, as it's not merely metaphorical or allegorical fi fire. You know, it, it doesn't represent something else. It mean, They interpret it as hellfire, okay? The fruit that the branches must bring forth is interpreted usually as works, or at least evidence of faith, this idea that saving faith must produce works. If we cannot see these works, then men, man sees a branch, but it does not, does not see its fruit. Uh, the commandments are being applied to more or less anything that Jesus commanded ever, or at least anything that they think you should be obeying, uh, which was already explored and debunked in our John 14 study, uh, seeing why the commandments in this passage isn't really talking about sins of the flesh. And really, legalists, they often have to arbitrarily pick and choose which commandments they think it applies to anyway. So we've seen, we've seen the merit and origin of conditional security from this passage. Now let's see its shortcomings and why it's actually easily disproved from this passage. Okay, We, we can easily disprove trying to use this passage to justify a work-based salvation. We can easily disprove that this passage is some kind of an urgent, imminent warning that you could lose your salvation today. Okay, We can easily demonstrate that if this passage did teach that you could lose salvation, let's just suppose it did, it would be irrecoverable. But most conditional security advocates believe you can get your salvation back again. Uh, they very conveniently change the rules of how salvation loss actually works when it suits them. So they, they make rules in this passage that are different to rules that they put in, in other passages, and we'll see that in a moment. So the first problem with interpreting conditional security from John 15, notice who is doing the work according to this illustration. And you can see very, very quickly why you cannot logically get a works-based salvation from this passage. It says, my father is the husbandman, okay? He's the one that's doing the actual work on the vine. You are the branches and the branches are attached to the vine. So scripture is very, very clear in this illustration. It's the father that is doing the work. He purges, he takes away, you are a branch. Now, a tree or a vine branch does not do work. It's the husbandman that's doing the work, okay? The branches just either grow fruit or they don't, but the husbandman is doing the work. Now, they might try and rebut this, saying, you know, as those other verses we looked at clarify, there is work involved based on the commandments, you know, keep my commandments. But if you watched my study on John 14, you will remember that this is a very inappropriate interpretation because, first of all, they arbitrarily pick and choose which commandments they think you should obey and not obey. They don't tell you to go wash in the pool of Siloam, but Jesus did quite clearly command, go wash at the pool of Siloam. Jesus isn't talking about sins of the flesh with his disciples in these chapters here and turning, you know, turning from them in the John 13, 16 conversation. He's not warning his disciples about the drunkenness and, and the harlots on the streets in this conversation. Looking at what commandments Jesus actually gave in this conversation between chapters 13 and 16 helps us to understand what he actually meant by his commandments. Things like love one another, abide or continue in me, be of good cheer, believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, etc, etc, etc. And we can also see, as we looked at in the previous study from John's epistles, how he himself interpreted this same conversation that it means to abide in the doctrines of Christ. Um, and we will explore that later as well in our John 15 study. And also, just in case you hadn't noticed, fruit itself is not work. Fruit is the product of work. The husbandman does work and gets fruit. Any of you that owns a fruit tree knows you're the one that's putting the work in. It's the tree that grows the fruit, but the fruit is not the work. You putting the work in is the work, and the fruit is something that you're expecting to get from that work. Okay. Problem number two, then, is that although that there are some exceptions, most people who believe that you can lose salvation believe that you can repent all over and over again and get it back. This is not consistent with the passage, though, because once a branch is removed and cast forth, it's withered, and men gather them and cast them onto the fire, and they are burned. So scripture is very clear that once the branches are removed, they are burned in the fire. So how can they be regrafted or reattached onto the vine if they have already been destroyed? And this is similar to where they often quote Hebrew 6 to say that you can lose your salvation. But it did say in Hebrew 6 that if they fall away, it's impossible to get them renewed onto repentance. So you see how they're not even consistent with their favourite passages. And this is, this is kind of a side note, but looking at the same verse, notice who is casting the branches into the fire, because it doesn't actually say that the Father is casting them into the fire. 
it says that men gather them and cast them into the fire, right? Well, Jesus did clearly explain not to fear men because they can kill the body, but they can't kill the soul, okay? You should be fearing him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. But uh, Jesus is very clear in John 15, it's men casting them into the fire. Now, granted, this particular point is not in of itself a strong argument because the men in this illustration could be interpreted as angels. So it could be angels casting them into the fire. But let's just say that if that is so, that means then that this is an illustration only. So nobody can say, well, John 15 quite clearly says that you can lose your salvation because this is an illustration. It doesn't quite clearly say anything because if it quite clearly says you can lose salvation, it's very, very clear. Well, then it quite clearly says that men cast them into the fire. But we know that men can't cast you into into hellfire. OK, so we must allow some room for allegorical interpretation here. You can't, you know, you have to be careful with how literal you actually try and get this because you can't necessarily be consistent then. Um, either that or you can't necessarily interpret the fire as being hellfire otherwise so this is um you know open to interpretation as, as to what what this all really means problem number three then is that the legalists will try to make this passage such an imminent warning that at any point you could disobey a commandment and immediately lose your salvation you might do it in the next hour if you're not careful but this just doesn't really fit the illustration at all because an important condition of the father cutting off a branch is that it doesn't produce fruit. Now, anybody who knows the first thing about gardening knows that fruit does not just suddenly appear, nor does it grow continually all the time. Fruit takes time to grow. It takes time for the fruitful and unfruitful branches to manifest. A branch doesn't grow fruit continually all the time. It grows fruit at certain times of year different times of year depending on the plant species or the climate or the hemisphere but it you know it grows fruit only at certain times of year and different plant species i don't know a lot about this but different plant species grow fruits on what's called old wood or new wood and so um even fruitful branches may eventually need trimming and pruning anyway so that new wood can grow and eventually become fruitful uh, later we'll explore a little bit about that but i, I don't know a lot about gardening though Problem number four is that um, people try to use this passage as a dire warning passage, but actually this conversation in chapter 13, 16 is meant to be an encouragement to the disciples, not a dire hellfire warning, because, you know, he says, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. By this, all men shall know that you are disciples if, if you love one another. Let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. Ask anything in my name and I will do it. I will not leave you comfortless. You are clean through the word. So have I loved you. I have called you friends. Your sorrow shall be turned into joy. This is very, very, very encouraging language for something that's supposed to be this terrible warning that you could lose your salvation. Okay. And, and further as well, building on these encouragements, is that when Jesus encourages or commands the disciples, he very often uses the pronouns you and, or ye, you and uh, thee, thou, if specific to one disciple, with an occasional he. Whereas anything he says to look that looks like it could be a warning or a, a condemnation to the world, like being cut off or reproving the world of sin, Jesus always says he, it, they. He doesn't say you, ye, as if he's you know not talking about the disciples directly. So uh, we see then that when Jesus gives verses that look like they could be warnings, it's not so much about the disciples themselves not abiding, but rather being able to identify others who will not abide and be cut off. And problem number five is that conditional security advocates bend the rules and change the rules when it suits them to do so. Because if I brought out an eternal security verse like John 10, 28, you know, that uh, no man is able to pluck them out of my hand or my father's hand in verse 29. They will reply to that, well, no other man can snatch you out or pluck you out, but you can still walk away though, right? Okay. Well, how about this one then? We go to John 6, 37 to 39, uh, 37 and 39, sorry. I will in no wise cast out or I should lose nothing. So we point that out. Well, he won't cast you out and he won't lose you, but you can still walk away in my free will. Okay. Well, okay, so we have this premise then. I, it's you who walks away. The father doesn't lose you. He doesn't cast you out. But then when it comes to John 15, it says that my father is the one that takes them away. So they will use John 15 as a key proof text for losing salvation, where it's the father that takes away the branches. The branches don't just run off or fall off. The father willingly, willfully removes them. 
So they pick and choose the rules when it suits them. In John 6 and 10, the rule is that you walk away. In John 15, the rule is that you will be forcibly removed. So they're very inconsistent with their own rules about how this actually works. Problem number six as well is that they often use problematic terminology that doesn't really match the passage. So, for example, they might say something like, if you stop abiding in Christ, you will be cut off. But the problem is that there are only two types of people, or rather branches, I should say, in this illustration. Those who abide and those who don't abide. They're the two options. Abiding means, by definition, to continue, to stay, to remain. So if somebody stops abiding and they did not they did not abide in Christ, they don't temporarily abide and they're in the branch and they're growing fruit and then they stop growing fruit and stop abiding. Either they abide or they don't abide. Well, if they only temporarily abided, they didn't abide. Okay, now, as I mentioned earlier in the study, there are parts of the Bible where abiding is temporary, but that's not the case in John 15. So you only have two options. You can't invent a third option where you were abiding yesterday and you're not abiding today. That's not compatible with the passage. Same thing with growing fruit. Either you grew fruit or you didn't. There's no, well, you grew fruit yesterday, but not today. That doesn't work with this illustration. And so that leads me on to problem number seven is that there's only two options, the branch that produces fruit and the branches that don't. So if conditional security advocates insist that salvation must produce fruit, then if a branch produced any fruit at all, it means that the criteria for salvation were met. So a branch cannot be cut off for being unfruitful because it bore fruit. If a branch is cut off and it produced no fruit, but we have to have this fruit to be saved, well, then it wasn't saved then, was it? Otherwise, why didn't it produce any fruit? OK, so you see how they have a, a self-refuting uh, doctrine. And so we see very quickly the fundamental flaws of conditional security from this passage. They use a passage that says God removes the branches, the branches don't walk away, but then change the rules of operation when you invoke passages whereby God won't lose any and won't cast any out and won't let any be plucked out. So, you know, wh which is it? They're trying to justify a works-based salvation from a passage where God is the one doing the actual work. A branch on a tree does not actually work, okay? It just grows. They invent a new type of branch to the illustration that the illustration doesn't give because they have self-contradictory salvation requirements for this branch in the first place. And they redefine the meaning of commandments and fruit in this passage to be all about your sin and your personal obedience to all the commanded works in the Bible when those things are not fundamentally a part of this discussion in John 13 to 16. We've already seen them in my previous study of John 14, what the commandments are in context and how John understood them. Love one another as I have loved you. Continue in Christ, his love, his doctrine, his sayings, his words. Believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Be of good cheer, let not your hearts be troubled. So you see how they just turn a comforting passage into a dire warning. It's really bizarre. So perspective number two then, eternal security, um, or from the Calvinist perspective, this would be uh, perseverance of the saints, I suppose. And this doctrine borrows from passages about predestination and injects the concept here. So if a branch is broken off, God already foreknew it, so the branch was never saved, but was rather a false believer. And this, this presupposes that a branch in Christ does not automatically equate to being saved. Well, like conditional security, the, the, the Calvinist may also include the obedient life of the believer as part of abiding, whereas free grace and easy believers would, would not. So what are the merits of this interpretation and where does it come from? Well, later in verse 16, it's clarified that the disciples have been chosen to bring forth fruit and ordained for this purpose. So uh, conditional security advocates frequently emphasise free will as underpinning their doctrine and the reason why somebody does not abide. But this verse actually implies that bringing forth fruit is, is premeditated on Jesus choosing and ordaining those to do it. So if the disciples were at risk of being cut off as per the earlier verses, it, it's problematic to say that Jesus chooses or ordains something to happen and then that thing that he has ordained doesn't come to pass. And even according to verses 1 and 2, it's the father is the husbandman. He determines which branches stay on the vine and not. So tying this up with predestination, it's kind of meaningless to say that a branch was ever a true branch or saved because it was already foreknown and foreseen by God that a branch would be broken off anyway. Oh. And following on from this, if we make a link between abiding in him and having my words abide in you, uh, particularly in John's epistle where he picks up the same themes, we can tie this with similar verses elsewhere that relate abiding 
to believing in him or holding on to the initial truth that we received i it's about faith not not works so you know john 5 38 you have not his word abiding in you well jesus did say if my words abide in you for him who we are sent you him you believe not so jesus seems to offer in john 5 that the key to having his word abide in you which is what needs to happen there is is believing okay uh, second john it talks about abiding in the doctrine of christ that's what you're continuing in the doctrine the truth of who christ is and then um in his first epistle he said let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning so if you have heard from the beginning that that shall remain in you so shall you continue so you shall continue with what you heard the word at the beginning that's what's continuing so it's holding on to the words that you heard at the beginning um and he says a, couple, a few verses later the anointing that you have received abides in you that same anointing teaches you all things and is truth and even as this is taught you shall abide in him so again the holy spirit giving you the truth and you're continuing in the truth so um there is some credibility then to the eternal security view um if we understand that the disciples were chosen and if we understand that god foreknows all things and i've used a similar argument in my study of john 6 earlier in the series because jesus knows from the beginning who believe not so it's meaningless to say they were once saved and now not if god already foresaw that that would happen anyway and there's, there's no there is such concepts in the bible as believing in vain first corinthians 15 so um as much as i do think then that there is credibility to reading eternal security from john 15 as one of the aspects it's talking about it does open up some fundamental problems which are going to be a thorn on our side though if we can't answer them when when confronted right so we're still using a passage which doesn't mention eternal life specifically to set the doctrine for eternal life well i, I can argue that john 15 is perfectly consistent with eternal security and does justify it but it just it wouldn't be my go-to proof text for the doctrine though uh, in the illustration the father is removing branches reactively rather than proactively so if this is to be consistent with god's foreknowledge we need to explain why he's doing this you know why didn't he cut off the branch long before it would ever even grow through anyway he's waiting to, for it to be manifest so this is reactive rather than proactive uh, we need to explain what a branch in christ actually is then because if it, if it doesn't automatically include being saved it, it does now sound like a meaningless concept doesn't it you know it, and if it's not saved how can we say that somebody's a branch in christ even temporarily um we we could inject the concept of uh, grafting from romans 11 into this passage which would help to answer uh, but we, we do have to be careful about putting words in jesus mouth if he's talking about something else though because he isn't talking about grafting and he isn't talking about jews versus gentiles in this chapter either um but also helpful learning maybe a little bit about uh, arboriculture and horticulture may help us actually to understand this concept in john 15 uh, because we have the illustration but we just need to understand how plant you know husbandry actually works and then we might understand the passage better and we need to explain how to continue in the vine and the meaning of keep, uh, keeping his commandments because a salvific interpretation means it can't be works of obedience if salvation is without works and really we did already explore the context of the commandments in the last study anyway so we've already got some good foundations for this from john 14 perspective number three then is the excommunication or disfellowship or disqualification view the discipleship view so this perspective removes any salvific connotations about john 15 making it more about fellowship and church or body of christ membership or discipleship or our relationship with god completely apart from salvation so the branches in christ are part of the body of christ if you like which may be in reference to church fellowship if you like so if a believer is too disobedient or stuck in major sin or is just otherwise not profitable in works for the kingdom of god this is harming the rest of the vine then they need to be cut off so that could be ejected from fellowship or disqualified in some way such as ministry or being called home um, and as i mentioned earlier i've heard this described as firing a useless employee in a particular sermon um, an advocate might say then well this passage is about discipleship not about salvation so what are the merits of this interpretation where does it come from well it does answer the, the problem of the fact that um, men gather them and cast them into the fire so uh, some would some might say that fire is very strong language if it doesn't mean hellfire like it seems a bit over the top but you know there are one or two other parts of the bible where fire like in first corinthians 3 is not equated with hellfire it just refers to 
you know, some, something slightly different. Like, so in Corinthians, you know, we have ejecting a wicked person and someone whose who's works are burnt because there's just nothing to show for it. Yet, yet he himself shall be saved. Um, and crucially, uh, as well, the concept of being multiple vines attached to one branch is very similar to the illustration of the body of Christ, where there are different members or branches attached to one body or vine. That is Christ. So they're the uh, merits, if you like. And just a few more. So furthermore, we, we see that Jesus in verses 14 to 15, he elevates the disciples from not being mere servants, but actually being his friends and ties that in with, with the commandments. And this lends itself to the discipleship argument, because then there is a distinction between a servant and a friend and doing what Jesus commands elevates a person to a friend but the servants still be belong to Christ. And one verse that springs to mind, like James 2, quoting uh, the Old Testament, it says uh, Abraham was called a friend of God or something like that. Um, and a key command uh, emphasised as well in verse 12 is you love one another, so it's man-to-man -man love, again, lending itself to the disciples loving each other as, as fellow disciples as being the key purpose of the teaching. So again, that, that's kind of removing the salvific connotations, if you like. And then based on the uh, joy in verse 11, um, that you shall ask what you will as well in verse 7, one might say that this has more to do with having a joyful Christian life while here on earth and having your prayer answered rather than anything eternal life related because these are the actual reasons that, that Jesus is giving. And so you, you can see perfectly well why somebody would quite legitimately say this is about discipleship, not about sal salvation. Uh, you know, because of the thing, the reasons that Jesus is actually giving here. Now, I, I do certainly agree that you can make an allegorical view to this effect. So if somebody does a sermon saying this is my view on this passage, I don't have a problem with it because I, I think there is an allegorical interpretation to that. But um, as it, you know, the, the John 15 isn't a parable. It's not a story. So it, it is metaphorical. It is figurative. You're obviously not literally a, a wooden branch attached to a, you know, grapevine or something. So there is room for interpretation of this illustration, and it could be this, you know, this view could be applied as one of the kinds of things that it's talking about, or one of its uh, aspects because the disciples will take the reins from Christ. There, there are a couple of problems. I put one problem, there's a couple of problems. But there are problems that I can envisage with this interpretation is that somebody is saved and still has everlasting life, but at the same time is cut off from the vine and cast into the fire. Um, so, because this now doesn't really have any meaning beyond church membership or happy Christian life which is not really being discussed here, strictly speaking. And he hasn't, at the same time as well, he hasn't abided or continued in Christ's love, even though we're still saying he's saved. So I think that'd be quite strange to say these two things at the same time as saying that he is saved. Because once again, this has very little meaning. Um, you know, shall we say that Christ still loves him, even though he doesn't abide in Christ's love? So... I would only apply the disqualification view allegorically, but I would not say it's the key purpose of the passage. And also as well, another problem with this interpretation is, is really that it does confound the illustration. Because if you think about it, if, if, if it means disfellowship or disqualification, well, the men casting the branches into the fire then could be interpreted as believers disfellowshipping disobedient believers. But then that means that the men and the abiding branches are the same people, even though they're separate entities in the illustration. Because according to the illustration, the, if anything, the branches represent you or the believers. Men don't. So because men are not branches and branches are not men, so uh, the, you know the men are only there for one reason, they're to cast the branches into the fire, which the, fa the Father has already removed. That's their only purpose. So to say that you are the branch and you're also the men in the same illustration, I think is a bit of a strange way to interpret it, which is why I wouldn't really make that my primary view. So perspective number four, then, is that God needs to call unfruitful believers home. So you could maybe sandwich this in the disqualification view if, if there is a chastisement aspect to it. But logically, though, some elderly and infirm people could also fit under this category, technically speaking, that if a believer is no longer fruitful for God, they, they need to be brought home to heaven. Um, it just doesn't fit the illustration, this view, though, because when, when the father cuts off the branches, he, he doesn't take them into his house. Other men cast them into the fire. So it's a very strange and unsuitable illustration uh, if this viewpoint were true.
So perspective number five is the sort of downtrodden or lift me up view. And in this perspective, an unfruitful believer is somebody that is down on their luck, if you like, or under attack by the devil, or otherwise extremely discouraged in some way or backsliding. And so they just need God's loving kindness to lift them up again. But even before I refute this, the, the Holy Spirit in you already ought to tell you how, why this is such a stupid view, really. Uh, you may wonder who actually proclaims this. Well, uh, I found a video where Joseph Prince expressed this view, so we know it's false. But his key argument was that the word for takes away in verse 2 in Greek is error, which means to lift up. And he says, you know, Jesus is always lifting people up with encouragement. That that was his argument. But the thing is, uh, you know, we've, we've got verses like take my yoke upon you or, uh, you know, take up your bed and, and be healed and so forth. So he used an illustration of a vine on the ground that is clinging to the ground and it just needs the Lord's encouraging hand to, to, to lift it up. Now, I'm not sure whether this is actually a great vine in this illustration. Um, assuming it is, notice that the entire vine is down, not, not just some of its branches, but there you go. So, yes, it's easily refuted. Um, there are plenty of verses in the Bible where error or lifting up is in a negative context, where even the passage surrounding it is just so obvious, you, you cannot possibly apply an encouraging or positive spin on it whatsoever. Um, as you can imagine, the verse number six about casting forth into a branch and being cast into the fire, you can imagine that didn't make it successfully into the clip of his explanation, can't you? Either the video cut short before he went on to explain that particular verse, or he just left it out entirely and declined to address it. So, now, as I have explained, I think John 13, 16 should be seen as an encouraging passage, not a stern warning, because Jesus is encouraging his disciples, but the outcome in verse 6 is not in itself an encouraging outcome. So that, you know, the Lord just needs to lift them up. It's a ridiculous interpretation. Perspective number six, then, is that it, this passage is all about being filled with God's joy and knowing confidently that, that God loves you. And if you don't know this or you don't have this joy, it, it, it could be because you don't have eternal life or maybe you, you are just lacking something. Uh, what are the merits of this interpretation? Well, it's based on verse 11 that uh, you could say, because Jesus says that your my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. So you could say this is the purpose or the reason why Jesus is giving this illustration. This may or may not have eternal life connotations, depending on who you talk to. Uh, and then you fast forward to John 16, and again, your your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Your joy may be full. So they obviously complement uh, 15.11 there. Are there any shortcomings? Then? Well, I do believe, based on verse 11 and, and some verses in our previous chapter study, that joy is certainly an aspect of this conversation. And this passage is supposed to be an encouragement, not kind of a stir damnation warning or something like that. But I would say that joy is only an intended outcome. It's it's not the main instruction, though, um, you know, because the end goal is that Christ's joy will remain in the disciples, that their joy will be full. But the actual instruction is to abide in his love, to abide in his commandments, to abide in his words. In other, in other words, the, the disciples are not commanded to remain in the joy, quote, unquote, but rather by keeping and remaining in, in these other things, Christ will give them joy. So I do not ex I do not accept that a branch can be cut off simply for lacking joy because it's Jesus that gives the joy. It's his responsibility. A perspective number seven, then, uh, tr true Christ, that staying in the true vine as opposed to uh, the false vines that are out there, such as apostate Israel or whether that's false religion or something like that. Uh, this is a view that I've heard Steve Lawson express. It's not an entire, entirely objectionable view. I do think there is some credibility to the point being made, but the way, well, certainly the way he explained it with these other vines doesn't really fit the illustration because in this passage we don't have false vines. It's just that we only have the true vine and the objective is to stay on the true vine. There, there is no warning about becoming attached to false vines in this illustration and we'll see why when we study it. But I, I do agree that this otherwise is an important aspect of the passage, that being attached to the true Christ and remaining in the words of the true Christ, as opposed to, say, what the Bible would call another Jesus or another gospel. So before we go through a line-by-line -line study of John 15, it helps to recap what we unravelled in our previous study and John 14 uh, to, to set some context. So very crucially, we looked at the meaning of, if you love me, keep my commandments, and we see in John 15 that keeping his commandments is a part of abiding in him. So if you love me, keep my commandments. 
if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. And therefore, if you abide, you know, in my love, well, do you love me? Keep my commandments and, and so on and so forth. OK, now, as, as we explained in the previous study, that the legalists misappropriate the, the commandments here to be, to be all about you turning from your sins or, or some kind of a, an outwardly obedient lifestyle. But what we found from that study was that they arbitrarily pick and choose which commandments they decide are applicable and, and which ones are not. Like They don't obey all of the commandments themselves. Like They don't obey the commandment to go wash in the pool of Siloam, for example. Uh, the disciples themselves didn't even follow all of the commandments to the bitter end, including the ones that legalists love to quote. Like They always quote that, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me but jesus was telling his disciples about going to his death and we know that nobody followed through with that his disciples all forsook him right so it's a bit silly that we then hold ourselves to a higher salvation standard than even the disciples themselves and important if, if this is important if we take the conversation in john 13 16 as, as the immediate context uh, of this conversation jesus isn't talking about sins of the flesh he's talking about loving one another as i have loved you a brethren to brethren love believe that i am in the father and the father is in me so who jesus is be of good cheer so you know the commandments are an encouragement not a dire warning and we looked at similar themes that, that John echoes in his epistles. We saw that the commandments has really more to do with, again, loving one another, as Christ has already said here, keeping our initial belief in Christ and in memory and remaining in the doctrine. That That's how John's epistles defined it. And again, we will unpack that again, even more so in this study today. So, uh, you know, when we looked at Jesus saying a new commandment and that you love one another and that all men shall know that you are my disciples, we, we see how... John interpreted that in his epistles he gave us commandment that new commandment keep his commandments referring back to the commandments that Jesus was talking about and you know just as Jesus told John love one another so John says it to us and uh, you know that we know we are the children of God you, you sh men shall know that you are my disciples and so we see how those themes are carried on there but John also adds to it as well starting with it always that we should believe on the name of the son of Christ so you know, John's making it very clear that, that that bit there is what you actually do for salvation. The rest of it is what follows your salvation after you're saved. And then if you remember, just as we looked at in John 13 and 14 uh, and 15, Jesus is saying, keep my words, abide in the word. Let my word abide in you. The love that I have for you, we carry that into John's second epistle. And what he's saying, a bit, bit different, but very similar, abide in the doctrine of Christ, abide, you know, in his doctrine that's how 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 we remain in him that's how we abide essentially and again you know a new commandment john carries that same theme forward a new commandment but that's the commandment that we had from the beginning love one another it's just re-emphasizing what what jesus already told him so john's epistles give us a very good in indication of how the disciples would have interpreted what jesus told them in this conversation so uh, we've we've already read the passage earlier in the video but let, let's start working our way through what exactly it's saying in these verses so we, we see that there are two types of branches essentially there's the branches that produce absolutely nothing and they must be removed and there are branches that bear fruit and are purged of those fruit that they may bear more fruit right and, and what we don't have in the because we only have two types of branches right we, we don't have an example here of a branch that produces fruit for a while and then stops producing fruit later we because that that would be an appropriate branch if you were to get conditional security from this passage it isn't there okay we we don't have that type of branch being offered here either it grows fruit or it doesn't there's only two outcomes there's no like well a bit of that and a bit of that there's no third outcome here we see that christ the son is the vine okay the branches are attached to this vine and the father is the one doing the work on the vine by by claiming the fruit whatever this means we're going to study what this means and removing the useless branches right so bringing forth fruit is premeditated on the assumption that the branch remains abides continues in the vine if the vine does not continue it doesn't bear any fruit so you can't say well it did produce fruit for a while and then it stops producing fruit well no it either it continued or it didn't and if it did continue it did produce fruit otherwise it didn't okay and so we will see that this punches more holes in conditional security because if somebody was in christ 
for a while, quote unquote, but then stops being in Christ. They, they didn't abide. They didn't continue. They didn't remain. Now, it seemed like they were for a season, but ultimately they didn't. And the father must remove such a branch. And we will explore, you know, what that means and how that actually works with this passage. So who the men represent in verse 6 obviously depends on how you actually interpret John 15. Um, I think there are damnation implications to this verse for reasons that will be explained as the study progresses. So if that be the case, then the men would really only be able to represent angels carrying out the act on behalf of God by, by throwing the branches into the fire. And there are verses that talk about, you know, to that effect of the angels casting them in and so on um now I, you know allegorically we can apply it to fellow believers in a non in, in non-salvific lessons from this passage but believers are the branches so i don't really accept that that can then be the primary application of men here because the men are not the branches and the branches are not men as i explained earlier so just to put this in an illustration then to put this into perspective so you know this is just a visual illustration of what we've read jesus is the vine now sorry, i know that's not a very good image but you know to bear with We've got these branches that, that bear off this vine. And so, you know, with all these different branches and the people who are in Christ, they bear fruit, right? And then uh, God is the father. He's the husbandman. And he's got to cut off any branches that don't bear fruit. And so perhaps we could put Judas in that category. We could put the disciples that walk no more with him in John chapter 6. And then once the husbandman, the father, has removed them, men gather them and, and they are withered and, and they cast them into the fire right so that's a good visual illustration of what's going on here so we are connected to each other and to to the disciples as well through christ right so there's like there's me there there's other brethren there's you assuming that you are in christ there's, there's the other disciples and so you see how through the vine we're all in, indirectly joined on to one another uh, in a manner of speaking and then so obviously if one of these branches doesn't produce fruit the father will sever the connection uh, the father also because remember it said that the father purges the uh, fruit from good branches right to, to the intention that they will grow more fruit and then you know removed branch withered shrivels dies is gathered to be burned right so to make any sense of this illustration whatsoever we need to be able to understand two things two things so first of all how do the branches remain attached to the vine what are the conditions of abiding in him now we obviously we saw to an extent keep his commandments but we need to expand on what that actually means if we understand how to abide in him and jesus's instructions to continue remaining in him then we also understand the second thing that we need to know is what the fruit represents in this illustration because once we know how to abide in him then we can figure out what fruit we're actually expected to bring forth and we can understand why some branches do not bring any forth fruit whatsoever and other branches will bring forth fruit right now, the mistake people make is fruit is often misconstrued as works. So now, there are passages that, that could be used to argue this, and we will explore this later in the study. But in the John 15 illustration, fruit is not the work. The, 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 the fruit is the product of work, right? The father is the husbandman. The husbandman has to do all of the pruning and the purging. This is the work that is involved in getting the fruit to grow. The branches themselves do not work. They, they either grow fruit or they don't and that could be based on a variety of factors and secondly fruit takes time to grow right so determining a branch that will or won't grow fruit is, is not necessarily immediately evident it takes time for this to actually manifest now god obviously does foreknow all things right but in this illustration at least he is removing the branches reactively so after the fact rather than proactively before the fact so even though he he know, foreknows everything he's still doing this reactively because that way it's then manifest or made known which branches will and won't produce fruit okay so understanding some principles in john 15 and, and tying it in with vine husbandry may help us to understand what jesus is talking about here so the central vine carries water and nutrition obtained by the root into the branches right so the branches they need this water and nutrition to be able to grow any fruit at all right that's just you know common sense about about plants the husbandman needs to monitor the health of the entire tree and the vine he needs to cut off branches which can affect particularly the health of the vine and by extension of this other branches right and jesus says as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except abide in the vine no more can you 
except you abided meat. So if one of these branches were cut off or fell off, well, they're not going to grow any fruit, are they? Because they're not getting any water and nutrition from the vine. That's just basic, you know, biology as re regards to how vines and trees work. So the question must be asked then, why does a branch not grow fruit? And there could be several reasons for this. Well, possibility number one, the branch is dead. So while the tree or the vine itself is not dead, branches on it may well be dead. Sometimes trees self-thin by killing off leaves and shoots and branches to preserve its overall health. Uh, trees may also self-thin because of stress if they don't have enough resources from the ground to sustain the requirements of the current growth, for example, during a drought. Possibly, uh, possibility number two is that the branch is diseased. So a branch could have an inf infestation such as a fungal infection or a termite infestation. So just as with dead branches, trees may self-thin because this disease could spread and damage and kill, kill the whole tree, right? Uh, possibility number three, the branch is broken and the tree cannot supply it. If, if irreparable damage has been done to the branch, the tree will no longer supply it with water and nutrition. It, it might fall off on its own accord. Uh, some branches are weak and more easily broken than others. Um, interesting to note, actually, this is just kind of a side comment, is that trees that grow more slowly tend to have stronger branches, actually, than trees that grow more quickly. So, you know, perhaps there's some sort of uh, hidden meaning behind that in regards to this passage, perhaps. Uh, you've got water sprouts and suckers, so they, they grow more quickly than other branches. They're very thin, they're not sturdy, and they're not beneficial to the overall health of mature trees because they're, they're weak points in the tree. They, they don't produce any fruit, and they are a, a waste of the tree's available resources, diverting growth from useful branches. So the growth of these sometimes indicates that there may be something wrong with the tree. And then uh, possibility number five, you've got old wood and new wood. Now, I don't understand a lot about how this works, but the, the rules here are different for various species. Some species flower on last year's stems, some uh, species flower on this year's stems, and so the timings of different species affects what times of year they should be pruned. Uh, pruning and dif differentiating between old and new wood is important to maintaining the overall uh, size and health of the plant. Uh, if this is neglected, then the plant could become woody and it, it doesn't produce enough of the right wood to start blooming. Um, and again, note that it's the responsibility of the husbandman to maintain this. God the Father is the husbandman, right? This is his job, not, not our job. Um, and so there's also an important principle here that branches which have already produced fruit as well must be pruned and, and scaled back a little bit to make way for new branches to replace them to grow fruit in the next season. Possibility number six is that not enough fruit was purged from the previous season. So this is a practice known as fruit thinning, where the husbandman removes some of the immature fruit so that the remaining fruit that he leaves attached will grow bigger and better, and also so that the, the plant will grow fruit, fruit in the following year, because if fruit is not sufficiently thinned, the plant might not grow fruit in the following year so as to conserve its energy. So since the father is the husbandman in this illustration, we wouldn't want to accuse Job of not doing his job properly, right? So we, we see why he has to purge fruit from the good branches so that they can produce more fruit. And lastly, possibility number seven is just environmental factors, you know, imbalance of the sun or water or nutrition for the overall health of, of the plant, or just times of bad seasons. Sometimes it's nobody's fault, it's just an unfortunate time. Or maybe the plant just needs more time, you know, like the uh, parable in Luke 13 comes to mind, where this, this parable um, complements what we've been reading in John 15, that you need to allow enough time for a plant to grow its fruit. And it may be that it just needs another chance or a bit more time. So in verse 7, there in Luke 13, a tree does not grow fruit. It's burdening the ground. It's taking resources that could be used for other trees. So it's a waste of nutrition. So we see why the father has to remove uh, unfruitful branches in John 15, because, again, they're a drain to the vine and, and the rest of the ground. Uh, maybe in some cases the tree or, or the, the, the vine branch in John 15 just needs a bit more time, just a bit more resources to try and get it to sprout. But obviously if, if it continues, as in verse 9, if it continues to be unfruitful, then there is a certain point where you have to say, OK, this needs to be taken out. It's not, it's not going to work. So with that in mind, then, we understand the role that the father must take here as the husbandman. Branches that are dead, diseased, broken he must remove them because they can affect the health of the whole tree right if the father does not cut off these branches the infestation could damage the healthy vine and the other healthy branches branches that are unfruitful consume and waste water and nutrition they divert and deprive resources from the main vine 
which could be used to help other vines produce more fruit and to help the vine itself to grow other healthy branches. Um, furthermore, if you know if the branch is dead or irre irreparable, then no amount of water and nutrition is going to help it anyway. So what, what's the point of giving it any? It's not going to produce anything no matter how much you give it, right? Because it's dead. It's irreparable. And also as well, this is probably less important to the illustration, but it helps us to understand the big picture, is that the husbandman has a desired shape and size for the tree. So even branches which are not unhealthy in of themselves are purged just so that the husbandman can maintain the tree to its desired shape or direction or size. You also have um, cross branches where the branch is sort of growing towards another branch and they have to be removed because they can scrape and uh, damage each other when, when blown in the wind. So uh, they're, they're, they need to be removed as well. And we also understand, if this is not already obvious, and, and this is very crucial, is that uh, it, it takes time for a plant to grow, right? It takes time for fruit to be made manifest. Plants only grow fruit in certain times of year and must be pruned at other times of year. They do not pour out fruit like running water, right? A grapevine typically, as far as I understand it, produces fruit between September to November, at least in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. And this does this may vary between species. And the vine will not typically produce fruit in the first three years after planting either. So if we apply that to the illustration of John 15, we must make some allowances. The branches need time for their fruit to grow to be made manifest. The husbandman is maintaining the vine so that it produces an optimal amount of fruit, and this means cutting off branches that are useless or harmful to the overall plant. And the husbandman also purges branches that have produced fruit anyway, so you know, purge, pruning them back, for example, to facilitate the growth of new wood to encourage more fruit to grow. Now you might ask, why is this important? Well, it, it, this, it's important because this is a slow-paced scenario, not, not a rapid-paced one. Because legalists who interpret this passage to be about losing salvation and continuing the works, they always have this sense of urgency out of this passage that at any moment, if you're not continuing in your obedience, you, you could lose your salvation suddenly, right? I mean, you could lose your salvation this afternoon, according to them. But that's inconsistent with this illustration because this is a gradual process where the father is gradually doing work on the vine and then the vine reaches fruiting season and only then is it made manifest the branches which will produce fruit and the branches which won't, right? So if a branch doesn't produce fruit, it, it's not because a perfectly good branch that did grow fruit yesterday has suddenly turned lazy, right? Rather, there is something fundamentally wrong with the branch itself. It's a bad branch. It cannot produce fruit. It is incapable. And it must be removed so that it does not cause harm to the remainder of the vine or, you know, drain their resources or something else, right? So, with that in mind then, let's see how we abide in Christ in this context. So notice what Jesus says in verse 3, that Jesus sandwiches this into this passage, that you are clean through the word which I've spoken to. So superficially, cleanliness wouldn't seem appropriate or relevant to this illustration, right? And yet Jesus sandwiches it here. So it, it must be very important to the meaning of abiding in him then. The disciples need to be clean to continue in this vine. How are they clean? Is it because, you know, it, it, it says right here, it's because they, uh, it's because of the word spoken onto them. It's not because they turned from all of their sins, right? Jesus has spoken the word and the word has made them clean. Interesting that he says word singular there. And then he goes on to say in verse 7, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. So Christ shows us that dwelling in Christ is reciprocated with his words, this time plural, dwelling in the disciples, and by extension of that, you as well. So we see what is very fundamentally important to abide in Christ, and this is very, very consistent with our previous study of John 14. Because remember, if, if you watch that study, we saw the true meaning to the statement, keep my commandments, based on how John himself interpreted it. Abide in the doctrine of Christ. Believe on the name of the Son of God, so accepting his testimony. Love one another as Christ has loved you. Beware of antichrists who deny that Jesus is, is come in the flesh. So understanding that it's about Christ's words, first and foremost, will help us to understand the vine illustration, how to abide in Christ and what the fruit is, etc, etc.
So just very quickly then, tying it up with John 14, we saw how Jesus did not tie his commandments with sin issues or works. Rather, he tied his commandments with his words, uh, his sayings in verses 23 and 24. And then we just carry that forward into John 15, because remember those chapter numbers weren't there in the original epistles, right? So you are now clean through the word, words, sayings, right? And then, you know, our, it's the goal is that Christ's words will abide in us. So the commandments has more to do with his words and his sayings, and we'll we'll see more about what that actually means. So this is really important. The emphasis of Christ's words are the crucial focal point, really, of the meaning of this illustration and perhaps one of the overarching themes of this conversation. When many people talk about John 15 and abiding in the vine, this connection is often very underemphasized or not even addressed in, in some of what I have seen. Conditional security advocates only ever make this passage see this sorry, they only ever see this passage through the lens of their own obedience and their own maintenance, right? The nicey nice sort of nice God called hell type preachers only ever see this passage through the lens of their own joy and emotional feelings. Uh, many only talk about abiding in the word superficially, but don't really talk about the implications or, or of what it actually means or entails. So we are going to have to digress from John 15 sometimes for a while to, to explain this point, but it is really important that we understand this point. So uh, just to give you a visual illustration, we have Jesus' words. That's what we continue in. We're abiding in Christ's words so that his word shall abide in us, right? So if we drift away from Jesus' words into not Jesus' words, well, then we're not abiding in Christ's words, right? So that's just a, a very clear visual um, illustration of how this is working. So are there any practical examples of this, or at least, you know, from a, from a salvation perspective? Well, in a way, yes, because uh, Jesus' words are associated with life, and he is the life. So abiding in the words that he gave and continuing in those words very specifically is quite important. So if Christ's words that we're supposed to abide in say, whosoever believes in me should not perish but have everlasting life but then somebody gets up and says well you have to surrender your life to christ to be to have everlasting life or you have to repent of your sins to be saved well the, the trouble is if that's not what christ himself said you're then in danger of christ's words not abiding in you because as far as i understand from the king james concordance anyway the word surrender is not even a biblical word it's not in the bible and whenever jesus said repent he never added these magical words of your sins to the end when when he was preaching the gospel to people so we're immediately in danger of not abiding in the words that christ actually gave right or if he says there is none good but one that is god so he quite clearly explains that only god is good but if you will enter into life, keep the commandments, someone then says, well, you have to do good and follow the commandments to enter life. Well, the problem is then you're not abiding in the very word that said there is none good but God, right? Uh, when the, when Jesus says sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee, well, people then change that to mean sin no more, lest you lose your salvation. Well, the problem is that's not what Jesus said in relation to what that means. So we're already in danger of Christ's word not abiding in you when your words start to drift from Christ's words. Or when Christ said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And we had to add, add this exception that says, well, you can still walk away. Though. Well, again, you're immediately in danger of not abiding in Christ's words, because to abide in Christ's words, you should be staying on those words. If you start staying on those words, you're not in Christ's words, then you're in danger of drifting off. So that's kind of a, a practical example, if you like. And let, let's just, here's a tangible example of this. So, Somebody one, I once saw this comment on YouTube. Somebody said, Baptists will tell you once you are saved, you are saved forever and there is no way you can lose your salvation. And he's making it out like it's just something that Baptists came up with, right? Well, it's not something they came up with. It's based on the fact that Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So there are those who trust Jesus to fulfill those words and there are those who don't. It's as simple as that. So... His reply was then, well, you didn't pay much attention to the story of what happened to David after, uh, I, I assume she meant, he meant she, met Bathsheba, right? Well, I replied to it, so let's, let's just see what's going on here. So he, try, he tries to pretend that it's man's words, right? But then it's actually God's words. It's based on something that Jesus said. So we just throw that right back at him and say, well, this is what Jesus said. And then he falsely asserts a conclusion here that, that I've not read the story of Bathsheba. Like, I don't know that ex story exists or something, or I didn't pay much attention. Well, here's the problem with that in my reply, is that 
I pointed out to him that none of the punishments described in 2 Samuel 12 say that David lost his salvation. All of those punishments affected him in this life only, right? So there's no evidence then that he could have lost his salvation according to that passage because Nathan didn't bring up his salvation. So his reply was then, nowhere in 2 Samuel 12 does it say that David could not lose his salvation if he had not repented. So here's the problem. He First, not only did he falsely uh, make a conclusion and it was refuted by a lack of evidence for his claim, he, he then goes on to, he then falls into this burden of proof fallacy where he's saying, well, it doesn't say that he didn't, you know, lose his salvation. Well, that's not how this works. If you say we can lose your salvation, you have to prove it. But he's basing what he believes on something that the Bible doesn't say, almost as if to explain something away that actually the Bible does say, because the Bible does say, no man shall ever be plucked them out of my hand. So you see, this is a tangible example of somebody not abiding in Christ's words, by going by what Christ didn't say to ignore what Christ did say, right? So in conclusion, you just see that this person tries to make out a doctrine as if it is based solely on man's words, when shown that it's actually based on the Bible, argues against it, and based what he believes on what the Bible doesn't say. Well, this, this is a primary example of somebody not abiding in Christ's words, when somebody argues against Christ's words and invents his own narrative at the expense of of the information actually provided by the Bible to get around it. And obviously we, we could go on all day about examples such as that. I'm not going to. So Christ's words then appear to be very uh, important to the immediate context, defining what branches remaining on the vine, uh, vine means. But let's keep delving because there, there is more that this chapter can, can offer us. So um, we saw earlier that branches that don't bear fruit will be cut off. Here it is intended in verses 8 to 10 that the disciples will bear fruit. So there's a, there's a few things to consider here. So obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we'll need to look at what the fruit means. What exactly should the branches be producing? Uh, were the disciples themselves be cut off if they were unfruitful? Because it's one thing saying that you and I can be cut off, but what about the disciples? Uh, and by that, I mean the 11 disciples, not Judas. And what does it mean to continue in his love? right? Because he says, continue you in my love in verse 9. Is it to do with my works? Is it to do with my knowledge of God's love for me? Is it to do with me manifesting God's love to others? A lot of people will question what that actually means. And how do we grow this fruit? How do we uh, remain in this love? These are obviously very important questions that we really want to explore out of this chapter. So let's start with the first question then. So were the disciples themselves at risk of being cut off if they were unfruitful so uh, if we were to take uh, this verse in verse 6 as kind of a warning of sorts if you like Jesus directs it at a man or you know he whoever he is right so the implication is that it could apply to virtually anybody but he did not direct it at his disciples because he, he could have said if you abide not in me but he didn't he just um, if a man abide not in me he whoever he is right on the other hand, one might say that then in verse 4, two verses before, he did specifically instruct his disciples to abide in him. And obviously, you know, he did say to his disciples, abide in me and you accept you abide in me. So we wouldn't want to make this commandment redundant or of no effect, right? But despite this, though, it does say later in verses 14 to 16 that Jesus specifically chose them and ordained them to so i don't know why i've put preach fruit there that's a mistake i meant to put bring forth fruit so it's problematic if we say that jesus chose or ordained but then this could potentially come to fail right furthermore jesus also is elevating his disciples from servants to friends who, who have already been with him already followed him already stayed with him even through the events of john 6 and we know it we know in hindsight that they will continue in Christ anyway right he would have foreknown this because he chose them so that their fruit would remain so i don't think that the disciples themselves were in danger of falling away per se their fruit has already been manifest to some extent but jesus that there is perhaps something that they are lacking and jesus does need to encourage them especially as they they may be somewhat discouraged by his death. Uh, it explains in the next chapter that they are sorrowful. Um, we explored this previously in John 14. So, so you know, why Jesus does mention joy in this dialogue is that the disciples' joy would be full. That's, that's why he mentions it, right? 
but the disciples will be resuming Jesus' earthly authority over New Testament believers, they need to be aware of this concept because they will encounter other believers so-called who will not abide and who will be unfruitful. So even if the disciples themselves weren't at risk, they need to be aware of people who may fall away. And we saw that abiding in uh, abiding was tied in with Jesus' commandments and his words. What about abiding in his love or have his joy remain in us? Because people will wonder, are these all the same thing or are they something different? So obviously saying abide in me, but is remain in my words, remain in my love, remain in my joy. Are each of those three things the same things? Are they interchangeable? And he's saying my sayings, my words, my commandments keep, right? Well, this is a very difficult. The thing is, this is a very difficult chapter to understand. And what a lot of people do with the Bible is often they do word swaps or assumed equivalency, whereby they automatically conclude without really thinking about it or questioning about it that different words or phrases mean the same thing. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of this. So, when the Bible says "deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me." A lot of people assume that that means the same thing as crucify the flesh, even though it's not really. It's two different people talking about two different things. Or when the Bible, when Paul says walk in the spirit and John says walk in the light, again, they assume that that means the same thing, that it's just an interchangeable way of saying the same thing. Or when it when John fourteen sixteen talks about the giving of the Holy Spirit, and then we have sealed by the Spirit in Ephesians, again, they assume that that's the same thing. And then when they read the Old Testament about the Spirit of the Lord departing from soul, again, they apply that to those two things there, as if it's just one interchangeable thing. But they're not necessarily interchangeable, and that's why the Bible uses different words, because... If, if, if they mean the same thing, for example, walk in the spirit and walk in the light, well, then they could have just both said walk in the spirit or they could have just both said walk in the light. But they're not necessarily talking about the same things always when, when they say those things. So first we must examine then, what exactly does it mean by abiding in his love? In verse 10, keeping his commandments ties in with abiding in his love. What does it mean to remain in abiding in his love? Because we, we, we could really, it's quite a cryptic statement and, and we we could wonder several things of what this actually means. Does it mean continuing the love that Christ has for you by loving others, otherwise he will stop loving you, or the brethren will stop loving you, or, or what happens if he doesn't love you? Or does it mean continuing the faith so that Jesus will love you, and if you don't abide, he will stop loving you, or he will, or you confirm he never loved you? Or does it mean continuing the faith or the love that Jesus has for you uh, will be of no effect if you don't, right? Or does it mean continue in the knowledge and understanding of the love that Jesus has for you? Or does it mean continue obeying Jesus or get sorely chastised or continue being a faithful Christian or otherwise somehow get disqualified or disvelopped in some way? So obviously it's quite a cryptic statement and, and I've, I've got, you know, multiple bullet points as to what this could mean. It, it could mean any one of those things as far as we know if we haven't established what it actually means. So be, because this is such a difficult and cryptic passage... I can't give you an exact answer and say with absolute authority, this is what it means, right? I, I, I do risk giving opinions here, and I must apologise in advance for that. But we, but we can examine the passage and apply various conclusions, whether more direct or allegorical. So how it applies to the disciples specifically, how it applies to us today, and understand as well how Jesus loves us or loved us so that we can continue in that in that same love. So for the disciples themselves, we know how Jesus has loved them up to this point, because in verse, you know, John 15, 9, so, I ha so have I loved you, continuing my love, Jesus' love for the disciples was after the, the, the Father's love for the Son. So consider that, you know, how did the Father love the Son, and, and how is this expressed in Jesus' love for his disciples? So um, in John 5, 20 to 21, and Jesus actually said this to a group that rejected him, interestingly enough, but the father has given the son the same power as himself to raise up from the dead. Jesus gave the disciples and us life just as the spirit would later raise Jesus from the dead as per Romans eight eleven. Um, and in John seventeen twenty four, Jesus says, you have loved me from the foundation of the world. So the father has a seemingly unending love for Christ that has existed from the very beginning until now. Jesus has this same love for the disciples. And salvifically, we have seen in this study series, Jesus knows from the beginning and he chooses. So like the father, he also loves believers, including the disciples, from the beginning, 
with an unending love. And just as the Father gave Jesus glory, Jesus wants his believers, including his disciples, to see his glory and be with him. This is his everlasting love. And we see from uh, Luke 3 and, and John 15 that the Father was well pleased with the Son as, as the voice of the Father came from heaven and said so. Although Jesus did not use this same turn of phrase in John 15 to the disciples, um, he, he did elevate them from servants to friends as they know the things that the Father told Jesus. So the, the 11 disciples have faithfully followed Jesus from the beginning to end. See uh, verse 27 below. Uh, the disciples in John 6 did not. They abandoned him. Uh, Judas was always false at, at the beginning, as we saw a couple of videos ago in the series. And just as Jesus heard the Father's voice, so the disciples heard Jesus' voice. And in doing so, they have heard and seen the Father, right? They don't need to hear it from the Father directly. And uh, just as the Father gave Jesus the Holy Spirit to help him do the will of the Father, so will Jesus give the disciples the Holy Spirit to comfort the disciples and to testify of the Christ that they've already been with so that they can bear witness to other people. So we see in summary how Jesus loved the disciples and how they must continue in that love, right? So if, if uh, you know, if the Father loved Jesus from the foundation of the world, so, you know, the, the Father's love for Jesus was from the beginning and also Jesus choosing the disciples was from the beginning. And so the disciples, and by extension apostles, must believe that their election is from the foundation of the world. So how does the Apostle Paul abide in that love? Well, he believes that God has chosen us before the foundation of the world, as he says in Ephesians 1.4. So if somebody then says, well, you were only chosen because you are now living a holy life and have now turned from all of your sins, and God just knew that you would eventually do this, and so when you turn from your sins, that's when he starts loving you, or that's when he starts choosing you, well, you're in danger of not abiding in Christ's love, because Christ's love and his choosing is from the foundation of the world. It's not from a certain point in your life, right? And when Jesus said that the Father loves the Son and shows him all things, for just as the Father raises from the dead and gives them life, so the Son gives life to whom he pleases. So, you know, just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so does the Son. The disciples will be responsible for preaching the Son, and in doing so, the Spirit will raise many from the dead as people receive their uh, message. So, uh, how does the uh, how does the apostle Paul continue in that love? Well, the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit. That's continuing in his love. He loved you to give you new life, to raise you from the dead. So if people start saying things like, well, there's no resurrection of the dead, which is something that Paul warned about in 1 Corinthians 15, well, then Christ is dead in vain. You're, you're in danger of not continuing in his love because his love was to get you raised from the dead, right? Uh, or people who say Christ is not come in the flesh, as John warned us about. Well, if, if Christ died in the flesh, to, to be res re resurrected from, from the, you know, in the flesh, well, that's his love for us. So if, if he's not come in the flesh, his love was of no effect, right? So again, in danger of not continuing in his love because his love was that he died in the flesh. Or if, if the, like the Muslims suppose, say that God has no son, well, the problem is the father loves the son and sent his son. So if we're going to say that God has no son, well, then we're not abiding in the love that God has for the world by sending his son. We're in danger of not continuing in his love. And, um, you know, as Jesus elevates the disciples from servants to friends, all things have been made known. So just as the father made known his will to Jesus, so then Jesus made known these things to the disciples. And so following this conversation in John 15, it would be their responsibility to pass on their teachings to the church, right? And to observe other commandments, for example, communion, which happened before 1316. Uh, that's an ordinance that they would be expected to pass on and teach people to observe. So um, Matthew, uh, con continuing in that uh, love, uh, you know, says, uh, he documents Jesus after his resurrection, saying to the disciples, teach all nations, teach them to observe the things that I have commanded you, right? So if if we're not then holding on to the doctrines and the teachings that have been taught as contrary to Titus 1.9, or if we're at risk of believing in another Jesus or another gospel than what's been preached, well, then we're in danger of not continuing in his love, right? Because the things that he commanded and the things that he taught and the words that he gave and the doctrines that he taught, that's all a part of his love is to teach us those things.
and then as we see later in chapter 15 that you know the comforter is is given to the ho- uh, you know the holy spirit so with the holy spirit the disciples must bear witness to the things that they have been seen and taught if they and as it says in uh, 26 to 27 they must bear witness so then uh, if they don't testify of the christ how then is the holy spirit supposed to be helpful for them in any way why would they need comfort at all and, and if they don't bear witness how will the teachings and the testimonies of christ be passed on to the next generation church after their departing and so john as somebody who continued in christ's love he goes on to say you know we have seen and do testify you know that the father sent the son to be the savior and he talks about in cha- in uh, chapter five in his first epistle that this is the witness of god he has testified of his son he who believes on the son has the witness he who believes not has made god a lie because he does not believe the record he does not believe the witness so the holy spirit is there so that we shall you know bear witness right so if we're not receiving or we're not believing the witness of the son but then it's up to the disciples you know to bear this witness as per romans 10 how shall they hear without a preacher if we if we're not receiving that or believing that how can we continue in his love if we don't even believe in the witness we don't believe in the record or if we say that the record is not enough as many of the legalists suppose so following this then we can apply the love that christ had for us and and see how we must also continue in that same love so uh, you know, remember in our previous study of John 14, we saw how jo- uh, salvation is based on Christ or God loving us, not not the other way around, right? So uh, we can now go to, uh, you know, we can now go outside of John 13, 16, because now we can also follow what the disciples passed on to us because they, they continued Christ's instructions. So we must continue in the instructions from their epistles, not just from the uh, gospel accounts, because not everything that Jesus taught uh, was recalled right so uh second thessalonians two sixteen, uh jesus gave the gave us an everlasting consolation and a, and a good hope through grace uh, revelation 1 5 jesus washed us of our sins in his own blood uh, romans 5 8 god sent his son to, to die for us while we were yet sinners so um I mean, you've got John three sixteen. God sent his son that we can have everlasting life if we believe in him. Galatians 5, 6, as Paul explained in Galatians, works of the law uh, does not avail our righteousness, but rather faith, which works by love, because it is according to God's love for us. It's not faith which works love, rather it's, it's faith which works by love, right? Important that you understand the difference there. And uh, 1 John 4.19, uh, he first loved us. The only reason that you love God at all is because he first loved you. And that, that's a very important foundational principle. And so once again, just like with the disciples, we see how God the Father and the Son loved us. So we must continue in that in that very love. So salvation or justification unto righteousness is entirely because of God's love for us, not, not because of our love for God. And if we have any love for God, it is solely because he first loved us. So if we start saying things like, well, the Bible says to love the Lord with all your heart, soul and strength, and this is what you have to do for eternal life, like law. Or if we say that Jesus is only going to accept those who clean up their life first and surrender everything. Well, we're in danger of not continuing in his love because his love is that we are justified by his love, not our love for him. Right. And uh, we we have to believe on the Son if we want everlasting life and consolation and hope. Um, And a later verse in in John 3 uh, explains that if we do not believe, it's because we have not believed. And so if we're continuing in anything, it's our belief, it's our faith. So that's why John talks about in his first epistle, let that abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. Um, And if that which you have heard shall remain in you, then you shall continue in the Son. And Paul says in Timothy, uh, you know, continue in the doctrine. So in doing this, you shall both save yourself and those that hear you. And that in in Colossians, he says, continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So that's how we continue in the love that he has for us. So if you if you discontinue the faith or you cast off your faith, as described in 1 Timothy 5 to 12, well, then you're not continuing in his love because his love requires that you believe on him. And also as well, there are, there are specific instructions and principles and foundations associated with eternal life and forgiveness of sins that we are washed by his blood and we have to believe on him. So if we start saying things like sur- repent of your sins or surrender your life to Christ to be saved or obey his commandments to be saved, well, then we're starting to change the actual requirements and principles as to how salvation is applied and worked. Um, and, you know, 
pe- people who deny the blood, you may be familiar with the John MacArthur blood controversy, where he essentially downplayed the importance of Christ's blood, but uh, you know that it's it's just symbolic of his death. But no, there's a very important foundation here that he's actually washed us uh, from our sins in his blood. So that's a part of what the love that he has for us that we have to continue. And if you start saying stuff like this, you're in danger of not continuing in his love. So concluding the continuing in his love then, we, we see that although salvation or eternal life is maybe not the main intended point of what Jesus is saying per se, it would be pretty difficult to acknowledge that it's uh, not to acknowledge that it's at least a subset of what Jesus is saying. So follow, following our previous study of John 14, we saw how keeping his commandments in this context is, is not about whether an individual Christian is pulling his weight or, or you know turning from all of their sins because that that's not what Jesus is talking about in this conversation and that's not how the disciples necessarily interpreted it either which we will look at soon so what is fundamental here is that the disciples carry on laying the foundations that Christ himself has laid and remaining on those same foundations crucially remembering the words what Christ taught them and continuing in the knowledge and the faith in the love that Jesus has for them and what he did for them and not departing from what Christ established even when persecution will come because they preach his testimony and as for joy that the disciples aren't specifically commanded to abide or remain in my joy rather it is it is stated that so long as they abide in him and continue in his love and keep his commandments if Jesus will give them eternal life and answer their petitions then they shall have joy despite the persecution that that Jesus is going to warn them about later in this conversation. And when we think of continuing in his love, we see how it hangs on his words, because in order to understand how God has loved us, we needed to look at what the Bible or the words told us, right? So although we could, you know, debate and discuss the specifics about differentiating between continuing in the joy or the love or the words, they're they're a part of a package deal. It doesn't really make sense to, to separate them all out here. And they are within the same passage of verses, so they're more interchangeable than, say, something like walking in the light or walking in the spirit, where they're two different authors talking in two different letters about two uh, very different things. So, from the disciples' point of view, some of the things Jesus says are more imminent because he is about to leave them, and they may be discouraged by this. Uh, you may remember when uh, I did the study video on John 14, I talked about the four C's of, of John 14 16. So, confidence, although that word isn't used verbatim, the disciples have faith in Christ, but it's, it's not a fully confident they uh, full assurance in Christ has not been realised. Jesus needs to solidify their confidence in who he is and what he will accomplish, right? And then continue, continue in or abide in the truth, the foundation that Christ has laid. Do not drift away from this truth, remain in this truth, never depart from it and do not be discouraged from it. And then comfort, Christ will depart and will ascend into heaven. We, we cannot see him now, but in his place, he will send the Holy Spirit to be a comforter. The disciples and believers will, will need this comfort if they are to continue in Christ, have have confidence in Christ and keep his commandments. And that's the, the final word there. Remember what Christ has taught and continue to teach it and to practice it. And as brethren, love one another as Christ has loved you. So let, let's just look through the, these four C's then. So starting with the confidence. that Remember that the disciples didn't fully grasp what they already heard Jesus say multiple times before so they really need to come to terms with these things in the time when for when christ departs right so uh as we saw from the previous video in uh, john 14 9 philip failed to grasp that by seeing jesus he has already seen the father and jesus has explained that he's in the father several times before in john's gospel so philip needs to remember this and hold on to this so that he's not he's not found wanting for something that he has already received really um and then we fast forward to John sixteen twenty four. Jesus points out that the disciples are sorrowful. So perhaps they were discouraged knowing what Jesus is about to go and do. And as he explained to them in John 13, but by seeing them again, they will be full of joy. So Jesus must go through and complete his death, burial and resurrection. This is a process that he must go through for the disciples to fully realize this. And then also in uh, John 14, and we can also pick this up in John 20 as well, is that Thomas didn't 
understand where Jesus was going again after Jesus has already explained it to him and based um, on the next verse you know he, he should already know the answer and as we know from later in the story then Thomas would be the doubter that didn't believe straight away so Jesus had to help him solidify his belief and if you were to look at confidence from a purely salvific perspective John himself picks up on this same theme and ties it in with abiding in Christ. So he says in his first epistle in chapter 2, Now little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence. So just as Christ told John to abide in him and his love, and to have Christ's words remain in him, John likewise tells us in his epistle to abide in Christ, with the very goal that when Christ comes, we can have a full confidence in his coming. And then later in the same epistle, in chapter 5, uh, John then goes on to explain that we may know that we have eternal life and following this we can have confidence that he hears us according to what we ask. Uh, 1 John fifteen fourteen also leads us actually onto the non-salvific aspects of John 15 that we can also have confidence that God will hear us according to what we ask when we petition him. So just as in John 15 he says abide in me and my words in you that you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And so likewise in John's epistle, you know, he's saying the same thing. This is the confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And confidence towards God that whatsoever we ask, uh, we shall receive of him. So that was the confidence. What about the uh, comfort? So we've we've just seen how the disciples were, were sorrowful. And even when Christ uh, will appear unto them again to, to give them joy. But they will need comfort after this as well, especially when they're being persecuted and Christ will, will no longer be with them. So Jesus warns them uh, later in John 15 that Jesus was persecuted because of his sayings. And if disciples abide in his word, then of course they will be persecuted as well. And so uh, the Holy Spirit will be sent to comfort them and to aid them as a witness. And he shall guide the disciples into all truth and bring things to their remembrance that, that have been taught to them before this conversation so that then they can pass on Christ's teachings to us. Right. So uh, how can we abide in Christ's words unless the you know disciples preserve his words for us? Because if you think about it, Jesus didn't write his own gospels and epistles. And so you, you can kind of see why the, the Holy Spirit needs to bring these things to their remembrance and then the uh, the other c so uh, commandments and continue and I've, I've these are sort of combined in a way i suppose the the final two c's because keeping his commandments is tied with abiding in him and, and to an extent these commandments we are continuing in so uh, in our previous study of john 14 we we saw how people misappropriate this to be about you personally cleaning up your life and, and turning from all of your sins but that's not fitting with the dialogue and conversation in this passage nor is it necessarily how the disciples themselves would have understood it and we did explore that in the last study with john to a little uh, to it to an extent but rather it, it has to do with remembering what christ taught remembering who he is and so you know passing on these teachings remaining in that teaching and standing firm in uh, standing firm to such truth so you know john 14 tied his commandments with his words his sayings of course his teachings on sin are a part of this because we, we have to abide in what jesus taught about those subjects right their, their teachings of the, the teachings of the apostles or the disciples should not stray from the teachings that, that christ founded including his teaching about those sins so what we'll do is we'll explore um how the uh just like we did last time we'll explore how the disciples themselves understood exactly what jesus means in this in this conversation of john 4 th well 13 to 16 so first let, let's look at how the disciple john picks up this theme of abiding in christ and, and how he interpreted the commandments in this regard and i'm kind of repeating what we looked at in the john 14 study here really but jesus is telling john jesus saying to john a new commandment i give unto you and so when john is saying to us in in his epistles he's saying things like this is his commandment he gave us commandment keep his commandments uh, obviously that one there is plural in chapter five there in chapter three that that's singular there but um it, it, it's a lot of similar themes that john is picking up from what jesus taught him and so just as jesus is saying to john then that the commandment that jesus gives him that you love one another as i have loved you and so john telling us what his commandment is again it's essentially repeating it love one another right 
and uh, everyone that loves him loves him that is also begotten of him. And so you, you can see how uh, John is carrying that theme forward. And then, just as Jesus says, by this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love to one another. So there's the goal, is that by loving one another, the world or all men shall look at this and know that uh, you know you are his disciples. And so uh, John also, kind of a bit different in what he says, but very similar is that by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God. And so, you know, loving one another has to do with making that known to other people that we love one another, right? And so that that that's, again, John is just interpreting those commandments exactly as Jesus said it. But what's interesting about what John says is he uh, often precedes it saying, we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and whosoever believes that Jesus the Christ is born of God. But that's not not strictly what Jesus said exactly there. But earlier in uh, earlier in chapter fourteen, he did say um, things like, you know, believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And so John is emphasising then, if you want to be born of God, this is how it starts: believe on on Jesus the Christ. So it's you know perfectly consistent with you know whosoever believeth faith without works. But then once you're saved, so if you're if you're begotten of God because you believe Jesus, well then therefore love one another and by that all men shall know and we shall know that you know we love the children of god that you are my disciples that you love one another and so you see how john's carrying in those same themes into his epistles and then just to take some uh, more example from his uh, second epistle so again jesus says a new commandment i give unto you we carry this forward and what's john saying to the recipient of that letter not as though i wrote a new commandment but that which we had from the beginning and we perhaps it's not always very clear who john means when he says we but if we take that to mean the disciples you know you could kind of link it back to this conversation right here and again that we love one another so he's repeating what that commandment was from this conversation yeah and so, uh, and then this is love. So he defines this love that we walk after his commandments, of which obviously one of them is is love one another. And this is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in it. So it's really just emphasising that commandment that was always there from the beginning, as far as John's concerned, beginning in this conversation. And then when Jesus was saying things like, "If a man love me, he will keep my words." the word which I have spoken unto you abide in me and I in you. So what, what are his words or his word? You know, his, his teachings, the things that he told John, right? What his words to John were. And so how does John carry that forward? Well, he warns us of these antichrists, these deceivers, and it's quite specific really, but they, they don't confess that Jesus is, is come in the flesh. And then uh, whosoever transgresses abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. So he that abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And so what is the doctrine? Well, doctrine is really another word for teaching. It's his teachings. Well, what did he teach? Well, presumably his words, the words that he gave to John, that's what he's teaching John. And so that's the doctrine that we're abiding in, right? That Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in him, as you can sort of see, have both the Father and the Son. And these antichrists, which are the, the antithesis of this, if you like, they're the ones that, that deny Jesus. And so notice how this has got nothing to do with sin like you personally turning from all your sins because that's not the kind of antichrist that john warned us about he warned us about people that deny that jesus is come in the flesh that's the kind of person that he was warning us about and so whereas uh jesus said by this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you love one another so we then get to this uh troubling verse in verse 11 where john says if there come any on on, on, any unto you and bring not this doctrine don't receive him into your house don't bid him godspeed and that that sounds like it's not loving right but it's, it's you love one another so we are united in the doctrine of christ who christ is right i can't be united in fellowship or love with somebody who doesn't carry the doctrine of christ right so the, the whole point is that those of us who do carry the doctrine we're born of god we love one another okay that that's essentially what what's going on there and then if we go to uh, John 15 and just wind back the uh, to to 1 John 2 there, 3 to 5, hereby we know that uh, we know him, you know, if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a lie. The truth is not in him. And, well, you know, what did Jesus say? If you keep my commandments, you know, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept the Father's commandment, right? And so, uh, as Jesus said to John, you are clean through the word. If you abide in me, my words shall abide in you. 
Um, and then, as, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Okay, we've looked at that. Continue in my love, abide in my love. And so John is essentially saying the same thing, albeit in a slightly simpler way. Whosoever keeps his word in him, the love of God is perfected. Okay, and so when Jesus then says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it's abide in the vine, no more can you abide in me. And so hereby know that we are in him, right? You see how it's all to do with, notice how all these commandments here, right? They're all to do with staying in the teachings of Christ, staying in the love of Christ. It's all grounded in who Christ is, not what you can do for God. It's, it's grounded in you following and staying in the teachings of what God has done for you okay and so you see how when people make this all about you turning from your sins they've completely misappropriated what's actually going on here because it's not the kind of thing that john's talking about when he talks about these commandments here and just uh, fast forward just a few verses more you, you can see how this repetitive theme keeps coming up here you know he keeps repeating this no new commandment i give but an old commandment which he had from the beginning so john gave them the same commandment that that jesus gave him in the beginning right the old commandment which you've heard from the beginning uh, you know continue in in those things and so you know it's, it keeps repeating and emphasizing and referring back to this, this conversation there and again, this uh, repeat of this same theme. You are clean through the word, as Jesus said to John. If you abide in me, my word shall abide in you. And so what's John saying to us? The word of God abides in you and you, you have overcome the wicked one. All right. So again, people want to make this all about you on this constant sanctification journey of overcoming the wicked one or overcoming your sins. It says you have overcome. You've already overcome. Right. The word of God abides in you. And and this, in a sense, that the audience that John is talking to there, that's already in effect for them, essentially. The word of God already abides in you. With Jesus, it was, if you do this, then my words shall abide in you. Whereas this this audience, his words are, you know, they already abide in you, uh, as it seems. Uh, he, you know, I've, I've written unto you, fathers, because you have known him from the beginning. So his audience already knows who Christ is. They already know the love of God. And so really, John is just re-emphasizing that teaching and reaffirming that teaching, because it's important as a body of brethren that we keep reaffirming that teaching so that people continue in it. Because if we start to drift from that teaching, you know, other people are going to drift. And eventually it's going to get to a point where people can't be saved anymore because we've drifted from the teaching that gets people saved all right and so just basically what i've just said you know i have not written unto you because you know not the truth but because you know the truth all right there's an established principle that john's audience already knows the truth and so his letter is written to you because you already know the truth and it's amazing how many people misappropriate that letter to be an instruction on how to be saved when really it's it's written because you are of the established principle you already know the truth right and just as jesus warned us if a man doesn't abide in me he is cast forth who is the type of person that john warns us about well it's the person who denies the son right that's the kind of antichrist that he's warning us about he's not warning us about uh, you know because people always make it out as if a lot of people say that john was trying to warn the church about the gnostics and they believe all this stuff about sin but john isn't warning us about somebody who believes the right stuff but just keeps going off and sinning all right he, he's warning us about people who deny who jesus is that's what this is all founded on okay and so uh, again jesus says to john the, the father has loved me so i have loved you continue in my love and so what's john telling us to do he that acknowledges uh, the son has the father right that you know that they just they both go together the love of the son the love of the father they both go together acknowledge that and again abide let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning yeah all of this stuff right here may that remain in you you shall also continue in the sun right it's all continuing in the teaching continuing in the doctrine continuing in who christ is because that's how the gospel is founded on that's the kind of thing that he's telling us to continue in this is the kind of thing that he's telling us to define the commandments that we're supposed to keep and so you see then that you know there's a very interesting parallel here then isn't there because just like jesus did in john 14 and 15 john also ties in the keeping of the commandments with the words of jesus and continuing in him continuing in his words who he is you know being the son that is in the father it's not really about your personal obedience in, in sin issues or doing of, of general works which is what many false prophets will try and misappropriate it to be about but again the problem is john's letter didn't warn us about these types of people he warned us about people who deny christ 
Uh, now, please don't suspect that I'm, I'm hiding something from you, because obviously John does talk about sin in his first epistle and loving the, you know, not loving the things of the world in in chapter two. But really, though, he, he's very brief about those things. He, he's not really emphasising them as the actual requirements to continue in Christ. The abiding is the continuing in, in the love of Christ and the words of Christ and who Christ is in the Son of the Father, okay? Because that, that's who the Antichrists are. Who are they? It's those that believe, who don't believe that, you know, in Christ. It's not those who believe on Christ but are continuing in willful sin, right? They're, they're denying a fundamental truth about who Christ is and, and what he did, such as that he came in the flesh. And so, obviously, yeah, he, he does talk about sin, but it's not like he goes into long lists of kinds of sins and sins in the flesh. But hopefully, once I've uh, finished my study on John's Gospel, we can start to move on to his epistles because although that doesn't come till a lot later in the bible i think it would be good to cover it quite early in the series because it's quite a difficult book uh his, his first epistle particularly and, and here's another interesting one okay so just again as jesus says if a man doesn't abide in me he's cast forth as a branch he's withered men gather them cast them into the fire uh, John describes people who, you know, departed from them, went out from us, the, these kinds of antichrists that he was warning us about. They went out from us, so just as, you know, these branches that were cast off were, were once part of the vine, right? So, you know, we were part of the vine, they were part of the vine, but, but they were cast out from us, right? But then he says they were not of us, though. Because, because why? Why does he say that? Well, if they had been of us, so if they really were, they went out from us, but if they had been of us they would have no doubt and this is going to be very important actually for understanding john 15 in the light of eternal security they would have no doubt have continued with us right so if they were really of us if they were really really truly of us they would have no doubt without any doubt continued right so if we apply a true christian if you're a true person and you're truly a um you know brethren of john you would have no doubt continued with him and on us, right? But what's the catch? What's the but here? They went out that it that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us, right? Because you might wonder why why go out from it if they're not of us? Why go out from us? Why just not be on the outside in the first place? That's a good question, right? Because it needs to be made manifest that they were not of us and that and that's kind of really what is going on in john 15 and we'll maybe talk a little bit more about that later in the study um you know when we get a bit more into the fruit and things like that but it, this is quite key here that it's it's made manifest it's made known that we can look at that and we can see that yes they were not of us we, we can see and observe that happening right that's kind of what's going on there and so John teaches us then something else that's very important about John 15 and the branches that don't continue abide. So as I mentioned much earlier in the study, uh, John 14 doesn't support conditional security for the reasons I've provided. And coupling it with 1 John actually really disproves and destroys the, the conditional security doctrine. Because who are they who, who went out from us but they were not of us who, who are they it wasn't people who were just sinning too much because he was warning people about the antichrists okay that that's what led up to that that statement there what were the characteristics of these antichrists that were never of us well they denied that jesus christ is is, is come in the flesh right or, or that he is the christ chapter two and four he, he warns us about it twice right and so how can we then say they were saved but then did not abide and were cut off the vine and so lost their salvation. How can we say that? Well, the simple answer is we can't, right? Because if these antichrists denied that Jesus is the Christ, how, how could they possibly be saved in the first place? They couldn't, right? Because one has to believe in Christ to be saved, right? That's how that works. But, you know, that, that's why John says they were not of us. Nevertheless, they, they went out from us, right? Which would make no sense if there weren't other branch, you know, if there weren't among other branches that, that do continue in the vine. So they, they were not of us, but they went out from us. If they were of us, they would have no doubt continued with us, but they did not continue, right? So they didn't meet the no doubt criteria there why they went out from us so that it might be made manifest right really simple not that's really not complicated to understand at all and so this is consistent with the illustration in john 15 because if you think about it we've got this growing fruit 
on on this vine, right? Fruit takes time to grow, right? We we don't know what branches will or produce it will or will not produce fruit straight away. It takes time for these branches to manifest, uh, as we saw earlier in the study. Really, you know, it, the, 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 this is it's not really a rapid process. This this is a a slow process, if anything. So enough about John. Then what about? Peter, does does he give any indication as to, to how he would have interpreted it? Well, with the other disciples, it's it's maybe not as clear if or how they picked up the themes from John 14 and 15. And so considering this question, it may be a bit more subject to conjecture and, and assumptions and you know, maybe my opinion, right? I, I suspect that though, Second Peter, particularly chapter two, may make reference to John fourteen and fifteen because there are some similar themes, right? So let me, let me show you this. Towards the uh, latter half of, of chapter two, Peter talks about this for it being better for that for them not to have known the the way of righteousness than after if they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered onto them, right? And you know Jesus is talking about my commandments over here. He's saying if you keep my commandments. And then in the next chapter, Peter then says to um, be mindful of, of the words. And again, Jesus is, is talking about my words, my sayings continue in them, right? Which was spoken of and, and of the commandment of, of the of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. And it's it's not really very clear from his epistle exactly what the commandment is or the holy commandment. But as he, as he says that the words that were spoken of before and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour, so, you know, the apostles are carrying forward the commands of the Lord and Saviour, right? And there's possibly a good link to this chapter right here that, that he may well be referring to that. So just as uh, Jesus was saying to Peter and John, if a, man, if a man doesn't abide in me, he's cast forth as a branch, right? Cast into the fire, you know the verse by now. Um you know, we had John warning us about the Antichrist, right? And that's kind of carried forward into the, these people that Peter's warning us about, these false prophets, denying the Lord that bought them, right? Now, again, people take Second Peter chapter 2 as one of these you can lose your salvation verses. But there were false prophets among the people, there shall be among you, denying the Lord that bought them. So, so how were they ever saved and they're about to lose the salvation if they deny the Lord? doesn't make any sense does it well why are there these false prophets then if they deny the lord why, why be false prophets among the people at all bringing in these damned heresies why not just stay at home they went out from us as john says but they were not of us right this is also it can be made manifest right it's all that we can identify that we can see that and it, and it will be made known before us and then um, elsewhere in peter's epistle so the kind of antithesis to these false prophets if you like or the the medicine or the solution to these false prophets that he's warning us about again just as jesus was telling us to abide in him and his words and his saying so that we don't get cut off peter's telling us you know to protect us against these false prophets and these false doctrines have these things always in remembrance okay the way of remembrance the commandment of our of us the apostles of the lord and savior so he keeps and he's emphasizing this remembering what you've been taught remember what's being commanded remember the words remember the sayings so you see how peter's just re-emphasizing and bringing it back to what did G, what did jesus teach us the apostles what are we teaching you and hey you Remember what we've taught you. Remember these commandments. Remember these things. Keep these things in remembrance. And we read in, uh, you know, this conversation in John, the Holy Spirit will bring things into Peter's remembrance. Yeah. And so that was uh, John and Peter. What about Jude? Did Jude pick up any of these themes? And this is the, the Judas that's not Iscariot. OK, I, I believe as far as I know, they are supposedly written by, uh, the, the, you know, he wrote the book, right? It's not a different Jude. Um, so with Jude, it's it's even less clear than Peter if he is really referring back to this conversation. He, do, he because he doesn't use similar terminology like love one another or you know the commandments or, or whatever. But his book though is very similar to Second Peter chapter two that we've just seen, and so he echoes some of the same themes as Peter. And so there could be a connection to John fourteen fifteen, sort of by e extension, if you like. So, again, Jesus saying to Peter, John, Jude, abide in me, or, you know, if he doesn't abide, he's cast forth, in, burnt in the fire. John was saying to us, they went out from us, they were not of us, who's a liar but he that denies the Christ? Peter warned us, there's false prophets who will bring in these heresies. 
What's Jude say? Well, again, a very repetitive theme here. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this con- condemnation, ungodly men, uh, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, and, right, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, it's this consistent theme here. Who are these people who are the antithesis of believers, the opposite of us, the opposite of the disciples, the opposite of those who love one another? They deny the Lord, right? This is very foundational to the kinds of people that they're warning us about. And again, uh, excuse me for repeating myself, but again, Jesus saying to Peter and and Jude, um, my words, my sayings, keep in them, abide in my words, abide in me. Peter saying, keep these things in remembrance. Jude is saying the same thing. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, right? Once knew that you once knew this. So something that you learned in the past, something that Jude or somebody else taught his recipients in the past, put you in remembrance of that thing I taught you from the very beginning. So again, it's just keeping the doctrine, keeping the teachings. Don't forget this teaching, right? And you can see how important it is for the gospel, right? Whosoever believeth in him, and 2,000 years later, everyone's saying, repent of your sins or surrender your life to Christ. Somehow in 2,000 years, we've forgotten the teachings of Jesus, right? Remember what Christ taught, yeah? I won't look at Paul only because he wasn't present at the the John 13 to 16 conversation. And so last but not least then, what about James? Now, like Peter and Jude, it's not so explicit that James picked up some of the same themes from John. I do find small tidbits of considerable similarity, but but looking at it from quite a different angle, though, from John, Jude or or, or Peter, right? So in in the case of James, this might be a bit of a stretch, but... Remember that Jesus said, my father is the husbandman, right? So he he uses that um, analogy, that the husbandman is what he's talking about there. James actually says something similar. In James 5, 7 to 9, he uses that that same word. Be patient, therefore, the coming of the Lord. Behold, the, the husbandman. So this husbandman, what's he waiting for? He's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. So here we've got the father is the husbandman, but he's, he's, you know, waiting for these branches to grow. He's purging branches so that they can grow more fruits. We've got this gradual process of growing fruit over here. The husbandman is waiting for the fruit and the time is coming when he's going to receive it. Right. And that's going to tie in with the coming of the Lord. And so what's James saying to us? He's saying, be patient, establish your hearts. The coming of the Lord is near. Right. And and Jesus is saying, abide. Yeah. So again, continue, be patient. You know, don't lose heart or don't drift from these teachings just because it seems like it's not going to happen or something. Grudge not against one another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. And James, really, the whole book, a lot of it is about brethren to brethren love. And what's John, uh, what's John fifteen saying? That you love one another as I have loved you. And so, James, maybe not as obvious, but you, you can certainly see a similarity there. That you know, again, he may just be reflecting back on those teachings and carrying it forward to us. And you know, he just keeps. They're all telling us the same thing: continue, abide, remember what you were first taught remember what you have heard right and love one another and and, you know don't grudge against one another it's just it's just the same theme being repeated and this seems to be how the disciples understood that conversation right so with all that said and done then i hope you will agree with me that the disciples have given us more of a clear picture then of what exactly it means to be in the true vine and how we abide in the true vine and we see how what they say is really very very consistent with, with how jesus described this illustration so we you know we've got the vine and the fruit so just as a vine would carry water and nutrition to the branches christ gave us his words right christ told us to follow his commandments abide in him that his words abide in us peter told us to remember what what we have heard right remember what we were commanded john told us again that which you have heard to let that abide in you and if you do this you shall also continue well you might do if you don't no you shall continue in the son and in the father no exceptions from the conditional folk there's no exceptions here just believe the bible when it says it and the promise that he has promised us even eternal life it's a promise you shall continue if you know if that abides what you heard the testimony of christ the gospel right if you heard that and you remember it and that stays in you that remains 
you shall continue in the sun and that promise is waiting for you for eternal life right so this is all encouraging language and jude also puts us in remembrance it's just it's all so consistent it's all tying together now if if a branch will not produce fruit then what what is happening essentially is it's it's not benefiting from the nutrition and the water that's given to it right and so really it's it's a waste to the rest of the vine and it encumbers it for, for no valid reason right so likewise somebody who does not continue in christ's words you know they go off and believe some weird heresy or they stop believing the gospel and we'll, we'll look at a couple of examples later what what's essentially happening there then is that christ's words are no good for that person his words are completely unprofitable to them right so just as a vine if a branch is not growing fruit fruit what's the point in the vine giving it water what's the point in the vine giving it nutrition that could go to some other vine that in a branch that is fruitful right it's no good well this person who's not going to abide not you know christ's words are not doing him any favors right and so ultimately they are cut off they're cast into the fire because if christ's words do not profit them anything how shall they enter into life? Because after all, Christ's words are essential to eternal life, right? You know, he says, my words are life, etc. And so because we have that understanding now then, perhaps it makes sense to look at the journeys of the branches. Why some branches abide and others do not? Because that's a good question, right? How was the branch in Christ in the first place i mean if they went out from among us because they were never of us you know what what does this even mean that that is a good question right it's an important question and when one branch abides and another does not and is cut off how is this manifest how is that made known how can we look at that and observe that and see that and know that that happened um and you might also ask as well another question is why does this seem to be a journey or a gradual process if eternal life is an entrance right because as i said earlier eternal life is not itself the primary purpose of the passage but it, it is certainly an important application and definitely a subset of what jesus is talking about but before we can understand the journey of the branches let's study what the fruit is first because if we can understand what the fruit represents we know then what the end result is and so we can understand what the branches are supposed to be heading towards like what the finish line is or what the goal is you know we can maybe understand that more so uh so what are the fruit and the branches supposed to reproduce then well it, it's somewhat questionable because what what exactly the fruit are from the context of john 15 itself it is not really that very clear verse 16 is perhaps the closest thing we we have to understanding what the fruit is exactly but it's still unclear though so what happens is especially you know with the works crowd right the mistake that people make is to automatically assume that fruit means works they, they just make that assumption without thinking about it or questioning it at all they, they just make that conclusion now there are definitely a couple or at least a handful of passages in the bible where you might argue this understanding right then you know that and they'll point to the commandments in this chapter obviously in john 15 but it, it doesn't really make sense when you think about it and especially with other examples of fruit as well first of all if we just look at the illustration that we're actually studying because we're not we're not studying all of the passages about fruit here right we're studying john 15 we, we already saw that the father does the work in this chapter right now you can go to all these chapters about fruit of righteousness but, but in this chapter the father does the work that's what's going on right on the branches the branches either produce fruit or they don't it's just that simple now this, this will take time to manifest if anything really here fruit is the product of work rather than the work itself because the husbandman does the work he's doing the work on the vine and as long as the conditions are favorable and he's a good husbandman and of course we don't want to accuse god of not being a good husbandman obviously then the fruit will grow as a result of his work right uh, but we are not the husbandman in this illustration the father god is okay so in essence just you know for those of you that like a picture illustration right the father is doing the work he's the husbandman fruit is the product of work that's the desired outcome as a result of his labor and as long as the conditions outside the vine are favorable and there's nothing wrong with the vine itself the vine should produce work that's what the father is waiting for with patience as james says it's the desired outcome of doing this work right now we could sort of stretch it and say well what what does fruit represent in the bible elsewhere right just you know just to make that cross reference if john 15 doesn't exactly explain what it is 
could we just look at fruit every other time in the Bible it's used? Well, the problem is fruit has many different applications in the Bible because it's just such a widely used analogy. And obviously in an agrarian society, that would have meant a lot more to people. Whereas, you know, now you might use an office illustration, but that perhaps doesn't apply to as many people, though. So uh, it, what you have to understand is that fruit might mean a completely different thing in one passage than another. So yes, it, it might mean works in one passage. That doesn't mean it does in another though, right? So I'm, I'm not going to read all these verses, but you can see them on the screen. Um, and, you know, it's there for you to see. So John 4 seems like the most logical place to start because it happened earlier in this same gospel account. And so to some extent, you could argue that John has set us up for chapter 15 already and in this passage if you just read the passage the fruit is life eternal right but in that passage though it, it does have more to do with getting other people saved by doing the work in the fields that are white and ready to harvest rather than your own salvation uh, and in some cases one person reaps what another you know another person's work so obviously we can't apply that to our own salvation really because you know even if the work i mean you're not saved by works but even if you were obviously your work would only help yourself anyway it wouldn't help somebody else right at least not what most christians believe i know you know there's weird doctrines about this and that and the other but we won't get into those so if we were to apply that to john 15 we would say that the fruit is life eternal and of course jesus chose his disciples why that they should go and bear fruit right and preaching the gospel was one of their most important tasks particularly in acts 15 and so you can definitely make that connection there with the disciples bearing that fruit, gathering that fruit, and that's the fruit that the Father is looking for. Although that, that doesn't really answer the point that the Father is doing the work, though. The disciples aren't really doing the work in John 15, exactly. And uh, elsewhere in John's Gospel, um, Jesus also referenced fruit in chapter 12, briefly, pointing to his death, saying that he must go through with his death so that he can bring forth fruit, right? Now, again, obviously he didn't strict strictly define it in John chapter 12 but seeing as it's about him going to his death obviously that would most likely seem a reference to the people that would be saved through his death right since that was the purpose of him doing so and so through his death to take on the sins of many God was able to redeem a people back onto himself and, and Paul seems to interpret it the same way according to Romans 7 where fruit unto God is the opposite of fruit unto death right uh, you know by the body of, of Christ and so um, you know, again, Christ is getting people saved. He's getting them eternal life by what he's going to do. That's how he seems to be defining the fruit. And uh, Jude describes a, a certain type of evil people in Jude 1 who, who are twice dead, which kind of gives an indication that uh, there's no salvation sort of, you know, possible whatsoever with these people. Um, but that's another story. But uh, as being trees whose fruit either withers, dies, or is entirely without fruit, all the tree is plucked all together, right? So this this is definitely a bad tree, but the tree itself is the problem, not the branches on the tree. The tree itself is the fundamental problem. And so given that he likens such a tree to being twice dead, it looks as if a lack of fruit or dying fruit indicates an unhealthy tree and salvifically is not saved, right? And so this once again justifies that the fruit is being eternal life because a good tree would produce that, that fruit, right? And then if we were just to go back to James 5, we, we already looked at this a few slides ago when we considered James picking up this same theme, using the same metaphor of a husbandman, referring to the Lord. So the husbandman is waiting for precious fruit of the earth with long patience. And the context here suggests that the husbandman eventually decides that when he's received enough fruit at the coming of the Lord. So from our point of view, this is this is probably when you know our gospel assignment ends, I suppose. Um, so in this context, fruit is most likely referring to believers that the husbandman is waiting for. Because, um, you know, remember earlier, fruit takes time to grow uh, and it only grows in season, right? So this is synonymous with eternal life. Those who are saved and adopted into the family of God with an everlasting inheritance. And although God knows the end from the beginning, remember that from our frame of reference, some of the elect haven't been born in the spirit or even in the flesh yet, right? So, I mean, unless the Lord comes tomorrow, you know, there are some people due to be saved. There are some people who are going to believe in the gospel in 20 or 30 years time who haven't even been born yet, either physically or spiritually, right? And so, you know, it's all got to wait for that 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 time, right? When, when the Lord's finally received all this precious fruit. Um, in Colossians, now, Paul's interpretations could be a bit of a red herring because he wasn't present in the conversation in, in John 14 to 15. But nevertheless, uh, here's another example in Colossians where he interprets the 
fruit being brought forth such that the gospel revealed the grace of God in truth to the Colossian recipients. And so we assume that they got eternal life, that that hope laid in heaven, right? So again, seems to be tying in the fruit with uh, everlasting life. And sometimes uh, in the epistles, we see this concept of um, fruit or fruits of righteousness. And when we look at those, they do sometimes look like they're a bit more works orientated or that your works do contribute to some of that fruit sometimes at least however for the very same reason that these fruits are perhaps grown by our own works that that's why they have a specific name right these are very specifically in all these passages that i've cited here they're referred to as fruits of righteousness or if you look at the corinthians example very specific fruits of your righteousness right so if if that's fruits of your righteousness and obviously you cannot get eternal life by your own righteousness because we know that salvation and justification unto life is without works and so to me it's no accident that when these fruit do seem to relate to works or at least look like they're about works they're not just called fruit full stop they have a specific name fruit of righteousness because remember other passages about fruit don't have those two words tacked on the end there right in john 15 it doesn't say abide uh, in me so that you know you'll bring forth fruits of righteousness it's just bring forth fruit right here we have a specific name unlike the fruit in john 15 and of course i couldn't possibly mention this subject without mentioning the fruit of the spirit right um the, of course we have the fruit of the spirit which uh, looks which like the fruit of righteousness appears to, to look like it's a bit more works orientated now that's debatable you could make the case that it's the spirit that produces the fruit rather than believer in a manner of speaking but you know i'm not going to get into that in this study but like the fruit of righteousness if we are going to say that that is about works right well once again this fruit has a very specific name it's fruit of the spirit it's not just fruit full stop unlike the fruit in john 15 which doesn't have a specific name okay i hope, I hope you can recognize the point that i'm trying to get across here and obviously, we, we couldn't possibly talk about the meaning of fruit in the Bible without considering Jesus' various sayings and parables. But parables, the, the only problem with parables is that they do present us a problem of being a bit more open to interpretation, right? Now, we earlier considered the parable of the fruitless fig tree. We already looked at that earlier in the study, and this was given one more chance that it might produce fruit, right? So again, gradual process, it's not necessarily manifest straight away. There are some examples of fruit which what I'm going to I'm not going to consider these in this study and um, because and I'll explain why I mean the fruit of the vine uh, that is only in reference to Jesus no longer drinking of the vine before wine before his death I don't think that sounds very relevant to our study of John 15 to be honest now this is a tricky one because the the fruits worthy of repentance that John the Baptist preached about in Luke 3 because although logically you would think that sounds quite important to our study it's a little bit awkward to define because john does go on to talk about works a few verses later and so people will interpret that to mean you know like works worthy of repentance but within the verses themselves the fruits refer to telling jews not to use their fleshly lineage to abraham i mean i'm paraphrasing obviously it doesn't say this literally but you know justification onto righteousness you know do not do not think to say within yourselves we have abraham our father for god is able to raise these stones right so some people will then take the verse itself and say that the fruit is faith others will take the, the later verse about works and make them about works so that's a little bit awkward to define so but again if you are going to say it is works well that fruit again has a very specific name though it's fruits of repentance it's not just fruit full stop right and then uh, we have the fig tree that jesus cursed because he cursed the tree before it could produce fruit in the appropriate season so it, again it might not be entirely relevant to our study in john 15 because that tree didn't even have a chance to grow fruit right so i don't some people might disagree with me about not cross-referencing those with john 15 but you know they, they are my reasons really um you know I, I, I don't really think it's very helpful for defining the fruit in john 15 for those reasons but there are some parables and things that jesus said in the gospels that are worth you know that that, 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 that which should worth looking at for, for this uh, study so when looking at jesus parables sometimes the meaning of fruit is less clear because you know as we said in the previous slide a parable could be open to interpretation and really the parables are there to illustrate another point rather than being central doctrinal statements in of themselves right so 
uh, if we look at this parable, the parable of the vineyard, vineyard. Uh, prior to this parable, we had the story of the two sons. They they had to work in in a vineyard. So one might think that this has works connotations, but actually, because a parable is there to illustrate the main point rather than inter- reinterpreting the main point because of the parable, the parable illustrated that the publicans and harlots sinners believed in John the Baptist preaching, whereas the Pharisees and many of the Jews did not. Now. The fruit in this parable is maybe not as central to the parable because the the fruit is not the purpose or the outcome of the parable, where it is kind of the outcome in John 15, though. But the fruit represents their willingness or lack of thereof of God's supposed people, quote unquote, to, to accept or follow their own promised Messiah that was sent to them. So kind of helpful, but, you know, the fruit aren't the outcome here, though. Um, it's, It's used in a slightly different way here. And then there's obviously, and a lot of people will be thinking of this one, is that the the good tree that produces good fruit and the evil tree brings forth evil fruit. Well, in this case, the evil tree still brings forth fruit, okay? But many people misappropriate the good tree and the bad tree to be all about Christians' works. But that's a misappropriation because it refers to false prophets. It's quite specific. Um, Immediately before verse 15, Jesus talked about the narrow way that leads on to life. And immediately after verse 20 talks about, you know, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And so the fruit here arguably refers to eternal life, or you could maybe say it's the doctrine and what they speak. Although it could just be the product of false prophets in general, with eternal life being only one of their evil fruits, that they don't, you know, produce nothing but evil. But in any case, you know, they cannot get people saved if they have a false gospel, right? And so you can see why it's sandwiched between two kind of eternal life things there. Um this is maybe not appropriate for interpreting the fruit in John 15, though, because in John 15, all branches are attached to the same vine, and the opposite of the branches that produce fruit is the branches that don't produce any fruit rather than producing evil fruit, whereas in Matthew 7, they actually belong to different trees. But there, there is an important... It's kind of a red herring, but um, although I haven't got it in the notes here, just something verbal to add is that that is still an important fundamental point though is that if the true if the fruit is bad or if the fruit is non-existent the problem is with the tree it's not the fruit the problem is with the tree right the tree is either good or the tree is bad and so um you know if there's no brand if there's no fruit the problem is there's a problem with the branch okay it's not just that it went lazy after being a good branch that it's fundamentally not a good branch, essentially. Um, I think the parable of the sower is probably one of the best parables that Jesus gave to help give us a broader understanding of John 15, because although Jesus um, is actually using a slightly different illustration in this parable, you know, it's not it's not branches on the vine, it's very similar in what it attempts to illustrate, I believe. So, Jesus will later explain to his disciples that the seed represents the the word of God, right, in in this this, sower parable. And we've now seen in John 15 how important Jesus' words are to abiding in John 15, right? We have a distinction here between seeds that grow fruit and seeds that don't, just as we have the branches that do and don't in John 15. And like John 15, this parable is also used to teach conditional security, particularly because of a later verse which, which we'll look at momentarily. So in conclusion, there's a lot of similarities because this parable actually explains a very similar point. The key difference between this parable and John 15, other than the illustration, is the intended audience, though, because the audience of this parable are arguably spiritually blinded, while the disciples in John 15 are not spiritually blinded, right? So there's similarities and there are differences as well. So let's look at how Jesus defined these types of seeds in the parable. And so now, now please understand this the seed is the word of God. Now, this is where we start, and this is what the sowers are spreading in the field, uh, the word of God. And you can liken this to preaching the gospel, if you like, specifically preaching God's word in a general sense to the, to the masses, right? So that, that's a very, it's very important that you understand that the seed is the word of God. So even though the seed is the word of God, in verse 11, in the following verses, the landing points of the seed describe the people that hear the word of God. So this is happening, what's happening here is that the word of God is going to land in 
four different types of places, or you might say four different types of people, right? Uh, in the parable, three quarters of recipients, I mean, this is not even statistical anyway, but, you know, with the amount of people that get saved, but three quarters of recipients do not benefit from the word of God to any useful degree, right? Only a quarter of the seed is actually successful and in reality, you know, the amount of people who get saved is far less than a quarter. But in this illustration, it's a quarter. And that's a minority anyway. So the first type of seed doesn't produce any fruit, or at least it doesn't say that it produces fruit. It's not evident that they produce fruit. They fall by the wayside. And so hearing the word of God is no profit to them, to the point where they're in unable to even believe and be saved, really. Uh, and this is important because the ending of this verse tells us that this parable is about faith unto salvation as a result of the word of god right because that you know if if this if this terrible thing that had happened to the seed hadn't happened they should believe and be saved but this all happened lest they right and so uh, you know the end goal is that they should believe and be saved that's the outcome of a, a successful seed right so this first type of seed has heard the word of god but this word hasn't profited them unto belief or salvation because of the work that the devil has done in them, right? You can liken that if you like to, you know, these God-hating atheists and all the reprobates, if you like, you know, just pick somebody. So uh, the second type of seed falls on a hard place. And this is interesting because to some extent, there was a good, solid foundation to where they landed, right? Because, you know, other parts of the Bible define God as, you know, the solid hard rock, the foundation, you know, that, that stone, the cornerstone. So in one manner of speaking, when you compare scripture with scripture, it sounds like a good place to land, right? Somewhere hard, somewhere solid, good foundation, right? But then you might say, in a way, the rock was too hard for them, which makes sense because Matthew's account tells us that they were offended, quote unquote, right? And so... Um, now, this is the seed that's used as justification for conditional security, because it, it does say, we can't deny what it says, that they did believe for a while, right? And fall away in time of temptation. Presumably then, if that if they did believe for a while, that's what they fall away from. They fall away from believing. But the, the trouble is, though, if you're going to say that they were saved and lost salvation, well, it's not really evident that the seed ever actually produced fruit, any fruit, okay? So, because remember that conditional security advocates say that we have to have fruit to be saved. So, how was, was it ever saved if it didn't grow any fruit, right? And if you, if you say, well, they believe for a while, well, the thing is, we, we have discussed this before earlier in the series, in other study videos I've done, there are concepts in the Bible, such as believed in vain, 1 Corinthians 15, a pointless belief, a belief that doesn't amount to anything, it was vain, it was pointless, why bother? Or we've got this concept such as Jesus knew from the beginning who believed not in John chapter 6, right? So there is disciples that walk no more with him. Jesus already knows those that are going to fall away. He already knows those that don't believe. And John also told us earlier in his gospel, he who does not believe has not believed. So if they believed for a while and don't believe now, John, th John 3.18 would force them in the category of has not believed. So once again, it's, it's not evident that this seed ever produced any fruit. And so they believed for a while sure but the, but the word of god wasn't really profitable though they didn't continue in that word and as with the first seed that the problem is with their belief not their works right and I, I, there's more i could say on that but you know the, this pass obviously this passage really needs its own study so i'm not going to delve into it too deeply here the third type of se seed is a bit different to the first two insofar as someone will actually make this more about works than faith again used to justify conditional security but, but here's what's interesting about this seed, right? The seed that falls in the thorns, the spiky places. Belief is not mentioned, so we have no surefire way of knowing that this seed ever even believed for a while, let alone got saved. I mean, at least we know this seed believed for a while. This seed, we don't know that, right? We don't know that they believed. We don't know that they got saved. We haven't got that information, right? Not only did it not grow fruit, as the first seeds, presumably, it's the only one of the bad seeds where Jesus actually makes a point of saying that it didn't bring forth any fruit to perfection or completion, right? And so again, if we have to have work, fruit to be saved, well, it didn't produce any fruit to perfection. It didn't complete any fruit. 
Okay, it, it might have grown tiny bit of fruit, but it, it never brought to completion. Nothing was ever ready. And so, lastly, then the fourth type of seed. It, it's the only one that we can say with any certainty, any absolute proof and certainty, that it did produce fruit. It, it even says with patience. It brought fruit with patience, right? Remember what we looked at earlier in James? Patience, right? Keep your patience. And so notice that they have a very different heart than that of the other seeds. Because the other seeds doesn't really mention their heart, but they, they had a good and honest heart. So there's a fundamental difference between this type of people in the root of who they actually are, right? Um, and so their reception and attentiveness is somewhat different. Their mindset is different. Their whole attitude towards the word of God is different because they have a good heart and they're honest, right? And so they heard the word and they keep the word. So they are the people that do continue in this word, right? And they bring forth fruit with patience. And so this is important. Not only did they hear the word, but they keep it. And a result of them keeping it, they bring with patience fruit, right? If we consider this type of seed to be the polar opposite of the other three types of seeds, we can easily define this fruit as salvation, because unlike the first type of seed, the fourth type must have believed and got saved, right? Unlike the second type of seed, they didn't believe for a while, they must have believed continually and indefinitely, right? And unlike the third type of seed, it, it produced fruit. Why? Because it kept the words, right? And so this is, you can see how similar this is to John 15 then, can't you? And so, so when we, you know, wrap that all up then, we see in conclusion why it's really inappropriate to classify the fruit in John 15 as doing works for, for several reasons. When fruit does represent works, or at least when it's obvious it represents works, it has a particular name given to it, fruit of the spirit, fruit of righteousness, or, you know, fruit worthy of repentance, if you want to include that one. It, it doesn't just go unnamed like the fruit in John 15. John's gospel sets us up for chapter 15 with fruit in chapter 4 and 12, referring to people getting saved onto eternal life, whether that's by, the, you know, Jesus saving an individual or you getting other people saved through the gospel. The parable about fruit that has most in common and most closely aligns with the subject matter of John 15 is the parable of the sower. And in that parable, the fruit represents eternal life, among other things, because unlike the other types of seed, the word of God was only a benefit to one type of seed. So what, and once again, Jesus is not talking about sins of the flesh or the di, you know, diverse obedient works of the believer in John 13 to 16, right? It's very specific, some of the things that Jesus is talking about. And so what exactly is fruit then? Well, based on what we've seen, it, it's, it's, it's certainly eternal life related, right? But there, there is a certain ambiguity as to whether it refers to one's own eternal life or getting other people saved onto eternal life. Well, we can to some extent take both of, of these applications in John 15, because Jesus is talking to the disciples collectively, love one another, and refers to individuals, he who does or does not. And so the end result of continuing in the word, the doctrines, who Christ is, is one's own everlasting life. But because a branch may bear many fruit, this can also apply allegorically, at least, to getting other people saved as well, because it takes a saved person who has the right gospel to get other people saved. Somebody who's not saved is going to preach the wrong gospel and won't save anybody. We, we won't address that particular doctrine in this study, but that's, you know, just a summary. So with all that said and done, we can start to understand what John 15's abide in me actually means. We've, we've done quite a lot of study on what seems like a very difficult and cryptic chapter in John 15, 15, 14, 15, but he's already told us really what it means Jesus has. Continuing Christ's words, the things that he spoke, the specific works he, words that he gave, continue in Christ's teachings, his sayings, his doctrines, his commandments, continue in the knowledge and belief of who Christ is, that, you know, he is in the Father and the Father is in, in him. Be comforted knowing that even in Christ's physical absence he sends the holy spirit in his place and and he's already overcome the world and he takes responsibility to save us so that we can be joyful and be of good cheer as the passage says don't be afraid of the world don't, and don't be surprised if it hates you either and so you know we, we've got some very specific meanings of, of you know what this really means and the disciples were very sorrowful in this conversation because they weren't too fully confident about christ going to his death but upon his resurrection he appeared to them so that they would not be discouraged from continuing in him and now we today we have the re revelation that christ fully succeeded and accomplished what he set it out set out to do we've got the gospels 
The disciples gave us that testimony, okay? We know that Jesus already accomplished this in hindsight. And so, you know, just to illustrate it for you, this is how we abide in Christ. We've got his words, we've got who he is, we've got his love, we've got his doctrines, we've got his comfort. That's what we continue in, and the end result is life everlasting. If we don't continue in that, that's those who don't abide. They, they don't end up with that life everlasting fruit there. So following this then, so some important questions arise out of our study. So I've put three questions here that I'm, you know people might ask me in light of what we've just said. So if somebody does not abide, what does this look like and why? We need to understand why somebody does not abide and is cut off and how we can actually identify and observe this happening. Question number two, why do we have this continuous language described as a gradual journey? if passing from death to life is an instantaneous entrance. And in previous studies of John, we've seen that salvation is more like an entrance, or, you know, drinking water, eating bread, or, you know, entering into the door. It's not a gradual, difficult journey as legally, I suppose. But in John 15, obviously, we get a very diff different impression because it, it's a gradual process that we grow this through, and it, it may succeed, it may fail. So that question needs to be addressed. And question number three is following the above. If, if salvation is the fruit whereas being in Christ is the starting point, well, then we really need to have a definition of what being in Christ actually means, because this is quite a challenge for us. If a branch is in Christ, but can also be cut off, how and, it, and we assert that it was never saved according to our doctrine, well, then how can we ever say that it was ever in Christ to begin with if it wasn't truly saved? Or does being in Christ carry any real meaning? Or, you know, are we making that of no effect, I guess, is a question that you could ask. And so these are some questions that we need to address. But before we explore these questions, though, it would be good to just to take a brief look at Romans 11 and borrow this concept of grafting, because this will complement what we've seen in John 15 to help us answer these questions, I think. And John 15 doesn't tell us how a branch was in Christ in the first place. We, we start from the premise that the branches are already in Christ when the illustration starts. Romans 11 does tell us how a branch was grafted into the main tree, though, yeah? And this might help us to understand the third question. And is John 15 talking about individuals or collective groups? In context, it would seem appropriate to individuals rather than groups. But Romans 11 kind of has a dual application because it's both individuals and groups. So we can explore uh, both of these applications to answer John 15 as well. And John 15 doesn't exactly set itself up to be about salvation specifically, whereas Romans 11 arguably does. Um, and the concept of grafting will also, again, help us to understand more about the illustrations about the branches being cut off and being unfruitful and how this is even consistent with eternal security. Uh, grafting, will, I think, will really benefit what we learned about um, you know, fruit growing and things. So, uh, just for the sake of time, because this is already a very long study, it's on the screen, I'm not going to read it all out to you, but in, in verse 1, Paul states that God has not cast away the people of Israel. He's talking about the Israelites collectively, so God has not cut off the group of Israel, because Paul himself is one of the saved, and he points to himself as an individual, right? So God has not cast his, uh, away his people of Israel, because I am one of them, and, you know, uh, I, Paul, am part of, part of the, you know... When it comes to election, the chosen save people itself, there there is a remnant, right? And so th this is not some radical New Testament concept, but an Old Testament concept as well. Even among God's people, figuratively, the carnal nation of Israel, actual saved people were a remnant among them. And Jesus frequently criticised the Jews for their unbelief. Yet he also said salvation was of the Jews as well. So regarding the people, Israelites were God's people figuratively, and God did bless the nation at times, but the number of people who actually believed unto salvation was only perhaps ever a remnant, really. And when the nation did turn away from God, the, the Bible did not only tell us about the sins of the flesh, but also many times, if you just look at all the different examples, very often false gods and false religion are also a part of it as well. So it's not just, well, they believe the right stuff, but they keep sinning. It's no, they sinned and they also believe the wrong stuff as well. Uh, you know, trusting in the wrong gods and so on and so forth. And then uh, in verse 16 of Romans 11, verse 17, notice how the branches are holy. So assuming that they are attached to the branch that is holy. Like the vine in John 15, branches can be cut off from the olive tree in Romans 11 too. But unlike the vine, it's also explained that foreign branches from non-holy olive trees can be grafted into the holy, holy olive tree. Yeah. 
And then further down in verses 20 to 21, we see that the requirements to not being cut off from the olive tree is belief, right? The same is true of the vine in John 15, but John 15 explains it much more elaborately and has other implications besides salvation. So what's important to consider here is that while Paul is referring to the Israelites collectively, they weren't all broken off. Many branches were broken off, but not all. So some branches were left on and there are still some Israelite branches attached to the olive tree. And then when you get to verses 22 to 24, even though Paul is describing the Israelites collectively them being cut off they abide in unbelief he then turns to the gentiles individually saying thou so um in you, you, you lose this from modern bibles but in the english in the king james the and thou is singular it refers to you personally or one person and uh, you know this is the context that you miss in modern english unfortunately so as a group the israelites were cut off before because they predominantly abided in unbelief but there are individual Israelites and Jews which do believe or, or can and will believe the gospel who, who can be grafted back on again. And so likewise, Gentiles or Christians cannot claim to be the true people of God by virtue of being Christian or belonging to the group that claims to be of the true vine, like, you know, the one holy apostolic church or something like that. Each individual person must abide in belief, right? And in John 15, this means more than just believing in Jesus in some kind of general sense, but it means believing in the right Jesus, believing in the specific words that Jesus spoke, following his doctrine in who he is and not denying the Lord as like the Antichrist and people like that. And so now to expand our gardening lessons then, just as we looked at managing vines much earlier in the study, let's briefly take a look at grafting. So hopefully you get what this concept is. You remove a branch, one branch that was originated from another tree, you can attach it to a different tree essential and it hopefully it will merge and become part of that tree now if you don't know a lot about this kind of thing you might ask what is the point why would you do this well there's various reasons um i'm not sure how you pronounce that word precocity precocity uh premature plants can grow fruit much sooner than their minimum productive age uh, which you know for some plants can take over 10 years before they can start producing fruit so you can get plants to grow fruit much sooner in its lifetime uh, combining properties so you can induce characteristics of one plant onto another such as cold tolerance or hardiness things like that so you know kind of benefits of both worlds if you like um, ease of propagation now, i don't fully understand this but for various reasons apparently it may be more cost effective to use the grafting technique on certain plants apparently uh, hybrids to create hybrids that take on the properties of, of two different plants uh, repair to repair a damaged tree uh, and consistency as well so in the case of apple trees apparently i don't know how accurate this is or you know i don't know a lot about this but one apple tree apparently may produce a variety of different apples in terms of size color flavor and so grafting is used to achieve the optimal amount of the preferred varieties as far as i understand that's as much as i know about the subject and this list isn't exhaustive it's just to give you an example of why you would do this right so there are various factors that must be taken into account to achieve a successful graft uh, the scion and the stock need to be compatible otherwise they, they can't graft you can't just graft absolutely anything with absolutely anything okay it's not like a cartoon where you just you know attach somebody's arm to something else or something like that um alignment and pressure must be correct with both parts being tightly pressed together and oriented in the natural direction for normal growth of that plant and appropriate times in terms of like budding and dormant seasons and seasonal temperatures and proper care of the graft site as, as shown in the picture on the left to nurse the plant back to health and to seal the area from excessive water or the potential for disease to end you know things to enter that shouldn't be there so they're just some of the factors that, that go into successfully grafting and just like with growing fruit in john chapter 15 it takes a while for a graft to finish so this may be a gradual process it takes time for a successful or failed graft to manifest though it may be sudden when it's manifest so after a while the graft site will need to be inspected now in the picture on the left um that i found two grafts succeeded these two on the left and the one on the right failed now um sometimes the problem you could, could have been that you used incorrect technique the graft 
but environmental factors can also affect success as well and obviously environmental factors aren't anybody's fault it's just so you know it's just what so happens so there are only really two inspection outcomes either the grafting union failed or it succeeded you would not say oh well then it was sex successful but then you know change your mind six months later because you've suddenly decided that it's it's unsuccessful and you know whatever it, it has limited time to graft okay these branches they need sustenance from the main tree if they don't get that they die so they're on borrowed time to graft right and so they're either going to be successful or they're not it's that simple so if the graft failed there are actions to be taken to protect the rootstock to prevent water loss disease etc very similar to the illustration in john 15 the health of the main tree is paramount and so obviously bad branches and grafts can damage the whole tree yeah furthermore then so the israelites were described as the natural branches they were never grafted whereas you the gentiles were grafted as the wild branches so at the time of paul's letter the gospels reaching out to the gentiles it was fairly new and a bit of an unusual concept you know as far as the jews were concerned the idea that it goes out to you know these gentiles the gospel almost two thousand years later though we live in a very different world and many of you have already grown up in church or some form of christianity so in a way you probably feel like you identify more with the Israelites, the natural branches, than the Gentiles in this illustration. Because just like the Jews had, you've grown up with certain biblical concepts since your youth. These are not new to you, as they might be to somebody who perhaps first hears about Christ as a grown adult or something like that. And so the Gentiles as a group were grafted in collectively, but you can be cut off personally irrespective of the group and the the israelites were cut off collectively but many in israelite individuals such as paul stayed attached okay and so this will later help us to understand what it means to be in christ according to john 15 and romans 11 so we, we see some similarities with john 15 there's only two outcomes either the graft or the fruiting was successful or it wasn't there's no third option of, oh, well, it did graft at first, but then a little while later it went wrong, and oh, well, it was growing fruit, but then, you know, then it stopped, and then we had to cut it off. There's only two options, right? This third option, conditional security option, it doesn't exist in this chapter. Um, if you are cut off, it's because of unbelief, and this may manifest in a variety of ways. Either you don't believe in Jesus, or you believe in another Jesus, or you believe in another gospel. To an extent, even in Romans 11, you could argue that you are already attached to the tree technically speaking because you were grafted based on the gentiles collectively being grafted into the stock of israel not based on you personally accepting the gospel so although romans 11 gives this illustration of a foreign branch being joined on at group level at an individual and personal level if you are a gentile christian then you were already grafted onto the tree in this illustration whether you individually can be cut off or or not is confirmed by your belief or unbelief after a waiting period as in john 15 so let's consider our three questions then i'm going to answer them together rather than in steps because they, they do overlap each other let's expand our questions so we can think of all considerations and hopefully close any loopholes so you know we asked if somebody does not abide what does this look like and why so we would need to then know why does it seem like somebody did believe for a while such as the parable of the sower but then suddenly stops believing and stops continuing in christ what what things could you know cause people to be pulled into unbelief or to stop continuing christ's words his doctrines if romans 11 was targeted at both individuals and collective groups and maybe john 15 was too what's the difference between cutting off an individual and cutting off a group are they two different things do they overlap uh under question two so you know we we ask why do we have this continuous language if salvation is an instant well uh there whether you know why are there several passages in the bible about continuing in the faith or abiding in his dot 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 if salvation is instantaneous and permanent why do the apostles teach and exhort us to continue why are god's people supposedly in danger of not continuing or falling away if it's you know once saved always saved or something if somebody was in christ but is now not how can we say that they are not or were not saved if they supposedly met the conditions previously yeah that's obviously these are some of the questions that we need to be considering following the above if salvation is the fruit whereas being in christ is the starting point we need we need to have a definition of what this means so if somebody who falls away is not and was never saved how can we ever say that they were ever a branch or were ever attached to the olive tree 
if somebody is an is a branch but is not saved and does not believe what does this actually mean what does that even look like okay the, these are all the kind of different things we've got to consider in our questions so even as early as the new testament itself the apostles warned us that false doctrines false teachings were already creeping in um, in their time it was often centered around individuals but in some cases for example second timothy 1 15 entire regions or sects became affected as well and some of these sects emerged around the individuals that proclaim such teachings um, paul's letters to timothy particularly the second one warn us about false doctrines traitors and seducers coming into the church to deceive so most of the doctrinal attacks would come from within the church rather than without uh, john also warns us about antichrist and, and peter and jude also warn us about false prophets and deniers as we look as we just looked at uh, collectively at group level jesus also rebuked all but two of the churches in revelation now because of this the study is already so long i'm going to be quite brief to illustrate the the extra biblical examples you know rather than giving many sources and drawn out explanations we'll be quite quick about it so just as paul warned us about there are several groups that emerged with various heretical teachings but they weren't they weren't exactly foreign religions per se rather they were sects that that labeled themselves as if they were part of christianity to some extent but then diverged their teachings away from biblical truth or, or they merged their foreign religious ideas with that of christianity so you may have heard of these two examples now perhaps a bit after paul's time but there was gnosticism so they they had weird ideas about the material world versus the spiritual world weird ideas about christ uh, they believed that salvation required secret or special knowledge and there was Marcionism centred around the person of Marcion who developed his own distinct uh, ideas from the Gnostic sects and believing in dual gods that there was some kind of different god in the Old and New Testament and he rewrote uh, Luke's Gospel and some of Paul's letters as well. So then various contrary teaching, teaching started to appear which also affected the majority of what is known as Christianity. So uh, many of those teachings then continue in the Catholic or the Orthodox Church today and to some extent uh, protestant churches too so um you know we have the teaching on, on communion you know we bless the cup do this in remembrance of me we bless the bread you know this is a collective thing somehow that's translated itself as to only the eucharist celebrated by the bishop himself is considered which it probably started by Irenaeus some point during 110 AD or around about that time and something that Jesus said do this in remembrance of me has now become a salvation requirement yeah uh, or something like baptism when it says believe and be baptized acts chapter 8 37 or, or mark 16 16 uh, and it is by its etymological definition immersion that's what the word means well that's now translated itself into somewhere along the lines baptizing infants which probably happened quite early um, and then sprinkling only which well not so much the orthodox church but in roman catholicism they just sprinkle but baptism does mean immersion so you can you can see how the teachings are starting to drift away from what christ founded um, other various teachings and sayings of jesus and the apostles so like he said call no man on earth your father or rabbi or master or blessed are they that hear the word of god and do it seducing spirits and doctrines of devils you know forbidding to marry commanding the abstinence of meats that that's what those kind of doctrines are and yet somehow that's translated itself into an endless list of excuses as to why it's okay to call their priest father or you know blessed is the womb that bear thee and the paps which thou hast sucked you know their weird obsession with mary when jesus said blessed are they that hear the word of god and do it and rules that you know priests can't marry and we must abstain from meat on fridays these are all the kinds of different examples where the catholic or orthodox church has, has drifted from the teachings that christ actually gave even though we still know today what christ actually taught because we still have those gospel accounts now they will of course give their various reasons for these deviations such as this thing that you know we are the one holy apostolic church that jesus founded and gave the keys to peter problem is that we are reading john 15 and jesus is very explicit and careful carefully telling his disciples to continue in his words his sayings his commandments so if the one true church so-called is not continuing in his commandments they, they've redefined and overridden the commandments right well as per romans 11 and john 15 it is possible to be cut off okay so you might ask them well what what exactly does that have to do with individuals abiding or being cut off well many of their false teachings arose from early church christian uh, fathers so-called and they weren't a minority view either now 
some of their their counter biblical views happened quite early in Christian history and engulfed so much of it that Catholicism and Orthodoxy became what what we would have at least at the time called mainstream Christianity. You know, you sometimes hear that term banded about. So people give far too much credence to the teachings of early Christians because they they supposedly represent what the church believed. But the the Catholic Orthodox mindset is that because they claim to be the true church that Jesus founded, they are always the true body of Christ and and that they manipulate, uh, sorry, monopolize salvation no matter how far their teachings deviate from what he taught. But the problem is, as Romans 11 already explains, the, the Jews really fell into the same trap. They thought they were righteous by virtue of their descending from Abraham rather than their actual belief in biblical truth. And Romans 11 says that they were cut off. So there is no reason to suggest that the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches are not cut off either. But obviously, if a Catholic individual believes the gospel, they, they can be grafted back in, of course. Uh, and in Revelation, we have warnings that churches can can have their candlestick blotted out and, and spat out of Jesus' mouth and so on and so forth. And so let's, let's fast forward to the... Um, reformation era then uh, various reformers such as luther and calvin among others sought to reform what they call the church quote unquote and bring it back to uh, biblical truth which you, you could in a way liken it to grafting it back in the holy olive tree i suppose the, the problem is though that they only really diluted catholicism and orthodoxy they, they didn't really reform or overturn it and in, in some of Jesus' teachings, many of them actually, Protestants are worse than the Catholics and Orthodox because they do things that even those denominations wouldn't do. Uh, I mean, many of the Protestant denominations still baptise babies and, and, and some sects within the Anglican Church really still hold to predominantly Catholic teaching. Anglican is quite a mixed bag because it didn't exactly separate in the same way that others did. So you've got mixed a bag of Catholic-like sort of kind of believers and you know reform types as well within the same uh, denomination. Uh, and while re- reformers made great efforts to overturn sacraments in, in giving voice to faith alone justification, they still propagated this idea that if one is saved, one will do works. Okay, So they never really left that, you must have the works mentality. And many of you know these denominations are promoting things contrary to the Bible, which even the, the Catholic Church wouldn't dare allow and you can see examples of the screen layer like you know female ordination or sodomite marriage and clerical officers or tolerating church mem- uh, members procuring abortions and things like that you know these are some things that protestant denominations are often endorsing catholic church or the orthodox church predominantly don't i'm not saying that they're not you know taking i'm not saying that they are taking a hard stance on those things but you know they, they at least give lip service to saying that those things are wrong and so fast forward again to modern evangelicalism where where it at least where it deviates from protestantism to some degree so you might think of like your pentecostalism and your charismatic movements right uh well we you know again we just as we did with the catholic church we can see where we've got clear biblical foundations and teachings and how we've drifted from that right so let, let's take speaking in tongues in the bible for example in acts 2 the apostles were able to speak to people in multiple languages which they never learned men from across the world were able to understand them right now in corinthians paul advises that it's better to speak in a known tongue and then briefly with very little context really mentions the tongues of angels with with little to no explanation about what that means or entails we've literally got one verse doesn't really tell us what it means that somehow translated itself into shakalaka whatever you know and, and tongues is the evidence of salvation right or you know gibberish is somehow a heavenly language based on one verse that doesn't really even say that uh, and being being filled with the spirit versus alcohol and demonic possession. So demonically possessed individuals lost a lot of self-control, did a lot of things they wouldn't normally do, and manifested in unusual places such as a graveyard. Uh, being filled with the spirit is diametrically opposed to drunkenness, according to Ephesians 5.18. And according to Corinthians, the spirit of the prophet is subject unto the prophets, right? But somehow in Pentecostal and charismatic teachings, that's translated itself to uncontrollable behaviours akin to demonic possession but it happens in the church and they attribute it to the holy spirit all of a sudden or uh, even when they are supposedly casting out devils it's funny how these events seem to take place during the church services such as with tb joshua or even after baptism such as this torben zondergaard guy you know like he baptizes people and then they start 
showing all these demonic signs. Well, the thing is, demonically possessed individuals in the Bible didn't need to be baptised first for that to manifest, and they were often in graveyards or very unusual places. And so, you know, it really, you have to wonder if it's more to do with his hand being laid on him that's causing that. And spiritual drunkenness. Well, drunkenness is the opposite of being filled with the spirit, according to Ephesians. They've translated that into spiritual drunkenness. And so you can see how, again, these teachings are deviating from the words and the teachings that Christ himself actually gave and the foundations that we actually have in the Bible. And although although there are three primary questions, there there is an extended question here, I suppose. Just because a person disobeys these commandments or drifts from these teachings that i'm speaking of do, does that mean that they did not abide in christ though because obviously after all under the free grace easy believism framework it is technically possible to be saved but but be in disobedience or error in in some matters and that and that is obviously true but you will find that it's just no coincidence though that it is predominantly unsaved people who fall into these errors and, and disobedience i mean I, i've never in, in my experience anyway i know that's anecdotal but i've never met a saved person who goes around calling priests father this and father that hashtag just saying okay I, i've never met a saved person who has uncontrollable bursts of weird spiritual manifestations at least that i'm aware of hashtag just saying um, I, i've never met a saved person who thinks that a sodomite taking a church office is acceptable. Again, hashtag just saying. Maybe they are out there, but I don't know about it. I've, I've never known a saved person who believes the right gospel kissing statues of Mary. Again, hashtag just saying. I've never, I've never seen that. Okay, I might be wrong, but I have never seen it. And let's just, you know, as, as a as a key example, let, let's consider the Pentecostal definition of tongue speaking, right? Because under the free grace framework, it is possible that somebody believes the right gospel and is saved. But, but still engages in this in this practice known as glossolalia. You know, and they go, ah, shaka, bab, head, li, 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 you know, all these tongue speaking stuff that they do. But what you will find is that this is typically, though, not some standalone teaching where Pentecostalism just happens to be wrong about this issue while still holding the right gospel, though. It, it fundamentally actually affects the gospel that they believe in because Pentecostals typically lean towards. Arminian doctrines of salvation, believing that it, it can be lost. And that's not exclusive, but that, that's often the case, I think. Uh, many Pentecostals believe that speaking in tongues or some sort of Holy Spirit manifestation is a necessary outward sign to justify that somebody really is saved. In other words, if you are saved, these weird signs will manifest themselves. Okay. So, it's, so you see how it's it's not just that they're saved, but they also do. It's that this what they do has become a part of their gospel that they believe in. So at a corporate level, a, a collective level, not so much about individuals, but collectively, you can see why so many Christians deviate from biblical teaching. And it just so happens as well that they also believe in a false gospel. So if, if we, because what happens is if, if we don't abide in Jesus' words, his sayings, his commandments, his doctrines, his teachings, then essentially we're not really abiding in the faith which he established. And, and since Christ monopolizes salvation and he taught important salvation doctrine, we can see that by falling away from his foundations and the gospel itself then must fall away too, because a true saving gospel cannot be built on false foundations, right? In other words, what you might say that I'm trying to say is the problem with the Catholics isn't that they're baptising babies in of itself, right? The problem is that they think they are aiding Christ in salvation by doing this, that, you know, their silly little rituals and mundane things that they do is somehow going to make a difference whether that person goes to heaven or hell. The, the problem with Protestantism isn't that they put women behind the pulpit. The problem is that they have to explain away God's various commandments, which then inevitably ends up, you have to explain away salvation passages as well. The, the problem with Pentecostals isn't that they're speaking in tongues. The problem is that they think this is how to test if a person is saved when, when tongue speaking is not the method by which a person is saved, etc., 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 okay? And even when the people, even the people who give the most lip service to living for God and, and surrendering ourselves to Him for salvation, are themselves really 
in this same error because the problem with saying you have to repent of your sins to be saved isn't that repenting of sins is a bad thing it, it is a good thing but the problem is is that someone thinks he is either assisting christ or somehow justifying himself by doing this right the problem with the surrender your life to christ gospel isn't that it's a bad thing to give your whole life to christ to work in you and through you that is a good thing but the problem is is that the mindset even if they won't acknowledge it it's still in their mindset that they think they're somehow sort of repaying christ christ for his kindness by doing this the problem with the work salvation message it isn't that good works are actually bad it's that the problem is someone thinks he is vindicating himself or complimenting christ's saving work for him by doing those works the problem with sinless perfectionism isn't that sinless perfection isn't like an ideal way of life or an admirable admirable desire obviously that's a good desire but the problem is that one thinks he only he only needs christ as like a reset button or a slate cleaner rather than actual preserver or saviour or carrier, right? So we've seen what this looks like at a collective level. What about a more individualistic level, which is more appropriate to John 15? What what does that actually look like? Because it's, it's one thing looking at groups, but then, you, you know, we could really make the case that John 15 is perhaps more about individuals. And, and this is a complex answer because everybody's journey is different you know I, I can barely cover even one percent of the various examples that, that people go through so i'll just i'm just going to give you a couple of examples just to help you understand this concept now um this picture that you see here i, I haven't done a lot of slides on this i'm just going to explain it verbally but this is a television show that was in the uk a few years ago and it was called the secret life of a four five six year old and they're basically getting kids in this nursery and they'd, they'd film them and, and examine the different ways that they solved problems and responded to temptations and different things you know just to study the, the psychology behind uh, young children and they had a special episode like a christmas special where some kids were brought in to do a nativity right and so there were all the these are some of the kids that were in the nativity and you know they filmed the kids doing different things as they get ready for this nativity and what was interesting about this slide is that this particular kid i think that you know i can't remember his exact age but they're between four and six essentially quite young um he's saying that jesus didn't really exist or, or something to that effect so there's not really a god or some I, I, I can't remember exactly what he said but it was words to that effect and all the other kids around him were all saying like yes he does and then they all started chanting like jesus 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 like you know that they all believe that that jesus exists right now as someone who lives and grows up in the uk you know i know that statistically most british people are not really that religious and i mean there are people with like vague christian beliefs but not really people who who stand by their convictions really seriously um and so i know this is a very small sample because we have only got six children that, that's not exactly a sample size but you know statistically it, it's highly unlikely that if somebody said jesus didn't exist among a group of six people you know six random people anyway that five other people would be all standing up for jesus right? and not not all of them would be that zealous about it really but obviously the mindset of a child is very different and so you know for them they they believe in jesus perhaps in the same way that they also believe in santa claus i mean if he said santa claus wasn't real they'd probably all start chanting for santa claus as well right and uh you know at six years old or five years he's probably not analyzed all the implications of this he's, he's obviously grown up in a family where he's kind of been taught those ideals to some extent you know if someone that young comes out with this thing that he never existed or, or whatever you know it, it's, it's probably been planted by his, his parents somehow but then statistically it's highly unlikely that all these other five kids are all going to grow up to be zealous you know on fire by or bible believing christians or something like that highly unlikely right and so many children what i'm trying to say is that many children both inside and outside of the church may believe in god or jesus in in some sort of generic sense in the same way that they also believe in santa claus if you like but but they do not have an unwavering faith in him or a full understanding of the gospel necessarily and, and really when they grow up like when they stop believing in santa claus they may also stop believing in god or never really end up believing the right gospel and so 
their faith as a young child lacking understanding is ultimately in vain you know when it, when they grow up and it becomes manifest that they're not really christian now now please uh, you know don't misunderstand me as belittling a, a childlike faith or belittling the idea that a child can get saved by the the simple gospel you know i i believe in those things and i believe that you know childlike faith is a very positive thing but but they're not the two points that i'm actually getting at here though okay the the, the point is that that many people even at a young age will have some sort of awareness of god and, and the bible and certain christian principles and for a season may even believe them sort of as the seed on the hard rock if you like but but they will eventually be offended or tempted whether they end up to grow uh, grow up and have a false understanding of the gospel or a false understanding of christian truths such as catholicism or methodism and then when you try to give them the gospel they don't want to hear it because they've just grown up with that all their life and they're never going to let go of it or maybe they will study religious philosophies or sciences they get older and eventually they'll deconstruct and i do actually have a deconstruction example to look at in a, in a couple of slides uh, maybe they will just grow up and forget about it and stop caring uh, you know and so very much like the seed that fell on the stony ground they, they had some foundation of some sort of which the seed to land on but it never really took root though it, it never really grounded itself in the word of god and so following that then as i said i would do it's, it's interesting to look at um christian deconstruction videos and so essentially what these are these are people who once identified as christian even as adults in, in, in many cases but but they don't now they they do not they, they don't identify as christian anymore and they kind of really epitomize the the people that don't abide in a way now um just as a warning just as a kind of a disclaimer if you like i'm, I'm going to show you a real example that at the time of doing this recording you can find this on youtube um, I would ask that you don't go on her videos and condemn her as an apostate or a reprobate or words to that effect. I think this has been a, a very painful journey in, uh, for this person. And unfortunately, she was part of a church that I think maybe displayed some, some cult-like behaviours and had an abusive works-based salvation, which is not her fault. And so if you do check out her channel um, and look at her stuff, pl you know, please do be merciful. Don't don't be like nasty to her or anything like that. And so this person, she's, she's called Sarah Martin and you can find her videos on YouTube at the time of this recording. And there's a video where she essentially titles it Why I Stopped Calling Myself a Christian. Um, her story is quite interesting to listen to. She gives insight into some of the uh, kinds of Christians she was around and her life as a Christian. And assuming that her testimony is trustworthy, she was a very zealous Christian. She took her faith very seriously. Okay. Now, uh, she released another video that was titled, Watch This Before You Accuse Someone of Never Being a Real Christian. And so she released this video insisting that you ought not to say about people like her, you were never a, a true, a real Christian or a true Christian. Now, if you, like me, you believe in eternal security, you can kind of understand why people might have said this to her. But um, what's interesting is when you actually watch that video and listen to the reasons why she says she was a true Christian, because what, what stood out to me is that her justification for saying she was a real Christian. Primarily, I did this and I did that and I was thus, rather than I believe this specific doctrine. Like, you know, she never really delved into I believed in faith alone or I believed in one saved, always saved, or this, that and the other. It was all, you know, I did all of this and I studied my Bible and I did this and I did that. And so, and, and she said in one of her videos, I can't remember which one it was, but she said that she had self-esteem issues but she started to feel uncomfortable with the idea that I am a sinner and I need to be saved. And her justification being that behaviours that we as Christians see as sinful or abominable are just a normal part of the human behaviour and experience. So she didn't really agree with the sin lens through which we as Christians tend to see these things, right? And so when we examine her testimony and, and you know, do watch her stuff if you, know, you just want to validate everything that I'm saying, you know, please do. But when, when we examine her testimony through what most of my audience would hopefully understand, we, we, we see something very fundamentally wrong with the suggestion that she was saved, but then lost her salvation. Because if she does not see human behaviour through the lens of sin and she never felt comfortable with the notion that she is a sinner in need of a savior then then how can we ever really assert that she ever really believed on christ to the to the saving of the soul 
unless whatever belief she has was really a, a vain belief. And her justification for being a real Christian, which is not really... That, that's terminology that I tend to refrain from using now anyway, um, because all sorts of people claim to be a true or a real Christian. It, it doesn't really carry any meaning anymore. There are people who are saved and people who are not saved. It's as simple as that. But her, her justification for it was based on her zeal and her works rather than a profession of what she actually believed. And if she does reference that she believed, it, it's in a general, generic sense of believing in Christianity rather than the specifics of faith and works or eternal versus conditional security. I, I didn't really hear her delve too much into those kinds of things. And so, really, it's very problematic if we are to say that the Holy Spirit did dwell in her and sealed her why the Spirit did not protect her, or why the Spirit did not answer her objections and keep her, because are we ultimately then to say that the Holy Spirit is a failure, and I think we would be quite blasphemous if we were to, to border into that territory. So if we were to say that she was never saved, in other words, she never passed from death onto life, how can we ever say that she was a branch in Christ, even, even for a season? Well, she did start identifying with the Christian mindset, irrespective of whether her peers had the right gospel or not, as an early teenager. Uh, she did believe in, in a generic sense that Jesus died and rose again, but she does explain that this was perhaps more to do with her self-esteem issues rather than an unwavering faith or dependency on the, on the need for Christ. Uh, she read and studied the Bible, but uh, she, and, and she read Christian writings and studies. She surrounded herself with Christian community. I mean, she, she probably read some of these Christian writings far more than I have, really. Uh, she joined and studied worship and study groups. She probably lived a much more holy life than most people outside of the Christian faith. You know, she wasn't going around drinking and fornicating as, as other college kids did. So this is like where Peter says they escaped the pollutions of the world. Um she did explain that she suffered spiritual abuse in relation to the purity culture. Now, I'm not quite sure exactly to what extent, but again, this this fact that there was this abuse going around suggests that there was a lot of, um, you know, work salvation in there. And my apologies because I've I've just realised I've not been having these slides on full view, but I've spent so long doing these, I, I don't want to do it again. I hope I hope you can forgive me. So. Uh, but anyway, we, we see her journey through the, the lens of, of John 15. To an extent, she was hearing the words of God, my words, my sayings. She read the Bible, she studied the Bible, she participated in biblical teachings and considered them. Uh, she even said she loved reading and studying the Bible. Uh, I'm, I'm sure she said that. Uh, and to an extent, she was she was following Jesus' commandments and not, not necessarily abiding in, in the teachings and sayings, but, but you know, following the ideas of Christianity and, and trying to live a Christian life superficially. Uh, she was counted as brethren uh, among her Christian peers and, and loved one another as, as Christ has loved you. And so they assumed she was Christian. She assumed she was Christian. She was called a sister in Christ. And But when we see her journey to its its full conclusion... She, she did not abide or continue in the love and the doctrine of Christ. She realised her views about sin, that she didn't agree with the Christian concept of sin, and she ultimately decided, I don't need saving. That's what she decided. Christianity is founded on this important principle, right? And she so she did not believe onto the saving of the soul, but really drew back into perdition, as um, Hebrews 10.39 explains. Uh, and as I said earlier, you know, please don't misconstrue what I'm saying as, as being mean to her or criticising her or denouncing her. You know, please don't post hurtful or reproving comments on her channel. Uh, she's not like an apostate that's going around spreading a false gospel of work salvation or something. She is, unfortunately, uh, somebody who did not abide. And we should be mournful about that, you know, not, not indignant about that. Um, when I listen to her story about the Christians she was around and asked some challenging, she asked some challenging questions, it sounded like many of them didn't know a Nazarite from a Nazarene anyway. And that's not her fault if she was around unlearned people who, you know, probably weren't even saved themselves, unfortunately. And many of them just gave her redundant advice, such as just read the Bible or just seeking God. But she was already doing this, right? And so just saying just seek God is, is not really practical in any way. And, and even after her deconstruction, Christians were giving this same redundant advice. But, but the thing is, if she has declared that she is not a sinner who needs saving, 
unfortunately, without recognition of that premise, no amount of seeking God or just read the Bible is ever going to help her because this is the premise is what it's what the bible says and that's the result of seeking god if you read the bible and seek god you will find that you are a sinner in need of a savior and so just saying just read the bible or just seek god it is not really helpful advice to this person and so next let's consider an example from the bible so uh, for the sake of time i'll be brief but um, if you remember when we studied john 6 earlier in the series it was Jesus's own disciples, now not the 12, but the other disciples that he must have had, who walked no more with him, right? It says in John 6, 60 to 66. Now, a disciple is somebody who is committed to learning someone's teachings. They're, they're not ordinary believers or infidels or, you know, ordinary students. They're, they're people who are committed to his teachings because that's what disciple means. But John confirms in his gospel account that Jesus already knew from the beginning they believed not and that they would betray him right and so that that's in verse 64 and so they they were learning from christ they were hearing his teaching and for a while they were his disciples but it wasn't until they stumbled on the teaching of jesus at a very specific moment in john 6 where it was finally confirmed that they would not continue with jesus Whereas the remaining disciples did continue with Jesus, obviously if we discount Judas, they did continue with Jesus and have continued all the way up until John 15. And as far as we know, they will go on to continue. So Jesus already knew this as per John 6, but the events of John 6 were simply the manifestation of this division before men where many of his disciples would be cut off from hearing Christ's words and they would, they would wither. So in other words, if it, if it wasn't for this conversation in John 6, uh, the, the other disciples, the other 12 disciples, they, they wouldn't, or the 11 rather, they wouldn't see this process of, hey, Jesus has got all these other disciples. They've been his disciples, but now they're not continuing. Well, obviously we need to know why. We need to know how that manifest itself and so that's really why we need that documented in john 6 why that happened and, and what actually happened that led up to that point so so we've looked at examples of believing in vain what about people who claim the label of christianity probably onto the bitter end in some cases but believe something that we would claim is false and we might think of somebody who still is a christian to some extent does believe in the bible uh, in a manner of speaking very confidently but maybe has a false gospel or, or you know another gospel another jesus something like that well those of you that have watched my content before uh, have known i you know if you're familiar with my content you know i've done, done a lot of work on this guy at pc unapologetics who's now changed his name very 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 ironically to abide in the word or you know he's changed his channel name recently i find it very ironic the name that he picked in the end but, you know, I've done a lot of content on him rebuking him sharply. And so how does he fit into John 15? Is he really somebody who has, who is not abiding in the same way as somebody who has deconstructed like Sarah Martin, for example? Well, let, let me apologise for yet again doing more material on this guy. I know he's just one of a million other heretics we could pick on. And, you know, he doesn't deserve this attention, but it's just... You know, he's just one of many people I could pick on it, but because I've listened to a lot of his content, especially his earlier videos, I'm more familiar with his journey and testimony, which is the reason why I'm just going to use him as a case study. And I apologise that I've already done so much on him. But um, so listening to his testimony, if you find his video about how he came out of One Saved, Always Saved, from what I gather, he had probably been saturated by calvinist teaching rather than free grace teaching because in in his earlier videos as far as i remember he tended to attack calvinism more so i think free grace and easy believism is probably been something that he's been confronted with after his transition to conditional security because we, we you know people in free grace and easy they've probably done it reactively after he's done all this content against one saved always saved on his channel now please don't quote me on that because i'm not fully sure but i think prior to him transitioning to conditional security i think he was more familiar with calvinism rather than free grace or easy believism so he explained in his journey that Christians around him were just like the world and that God began to reveal things to him, quote unquote, and bear fruit in his life, quote unquote, which really what he means by that is 
he started to turn away from his sins and start behaving more righteously and being more sanctified in his works and he has grown in his love for God, quote unquote. So really part of his shift in doctrinal position has more to do with him comparing his behaviour to other people rather than whether what he believes is actually doctrinally true. In other words, he, he's measured his salvation by his works performance when salvation is not by works, right? Now, unlike the previous person that we looked at, he does claim that he has found the truth in the Bible itself. And so from his perspective, he is somebody that is abiding to this day, whereas he would say that somebody like me is not abiding, right? Whereas I would just say the same thing to him because he thinks he's continuing in the commandments the sayings the words of jesus and those of us who believe in free grace or well really i could just call it grace really but but he would say that we're not continuing so people like me were not abiding he thinks that he is whereas i think the opposite is true who's right right okay that that's the question well he explained that he started to question the doctrines he previously believed mainly once saved always saved when the Bible says various things he believed to be contrary to the doctrine, for example, uh, Hebrews 10.26, um, he had looked at various explanations, such as those by John Piper and John Mac MacArthur, again, Calvinists, not, not free grace people. And what Christians generally said about Hebrews 10.26, but, but he wasn't satisfied with their explanation. So some of them would say something like, it's not talking about God's people, it's talking about the heathen, that, that's how they would explain it. But then obviously when you open it and carry on reading, it says God shall judge his people, right? So he wasn't satisfied with their explanations. And, and he started to question one saved, always saved, and no, no, and he, say, he says anyway, nobody around him believed in conditional security, and he started to quote-unquote feel like a heretic. Well, he wasn't wrong, uh, but um, he, he then asked God... Uh, essentially this is what he said he asked God in his testimony I want to know the truth even if there is something that I don't like and and if if he, I mean the thing is I've caught him lying on his channel so I don't exactly trust everything he says but he does say somewhere on his channel that he tried to confront his church pastor about these things and and I think it sounded like they neglected to help him or they kind of fobbed him off and didn't really help him I don't know how true that is that's just what he says now, what might be quite shocking or troubling to some of you listening is that this person, essentially, he claimed to ask God for help with this doctrine and ask God to show him the truth. And yet he ended up believing in conditional security, right? Whereas I, on the other hand, have asked God this same question. And yet I ended up believing in eternal security. Now, this, this might be quite hard for some people to swallow then because we have essentially reached a conclusion whether that be me or him that we can literally ask god someone can literally ask god to show them the truth and still be left in darkness right that that's quite a terrifying prospect if you think about it now there are at this time various sharp disagreements and discords circulating on youtube in various free grace circles between people about predestination versus free will as, as they pertain to salvation and, and they have opposing answers to this conundrum so a few people have been sort of falling out and, and gr grouping themselves over this issue I, i'm not really going to address john 15 in light of this controversy because this study is not about that um, really what i'm going to show is i'm going to show you it from my frame of reference and from epiusion apologetics or abide in the words frame of reference so we're going to look at it more from our frame of reference rather than God's frame of reference. And the reason being, you know, yes, there are passages about God drawing us, Christ holding on to us for eternal life and God predestination, predestining us for salvation and electing. And, uh, but, but the things, we, we can't apply that quite so easily to John 15. Although we just say I've chosen the disciples, there is an aspect of it. But remember that Jesus is telling us or his disciples to abide in him that's the instruction so because he's telling he's telling you or he's telling me or he's telling the disciples abide in me that's our instruction I think for the sake of the study it makes more I think it's more helpful to explore it through the lens of our responsibility on this particular issue rather than Christ's responsibility okay so in his journey out of one saved always saved he explains about nine I think it's about nine minutes, 35 seconds in that he would look, he faced verses such as, you know, one of our famous conditional, uh, sorry, 
famous eternal security verses that we all know and love. Nobody can pluck them out of my hand from John 10, 28, 29, right? Now, what was his response? How did he handle this verse? Well, his answer in this video was that his, he said, my thought process was thinking that says nothing about me walking away, right? So he opens the Bible. It says, no man can ever pluck them out of my hand. It doesn't say anything about me walking away. That's his logic. That's what his thought process is telling himself, right? Now, again, obviously you're relying on me telling the truth about him, but there's the video. So you can go on this video and you can find it yourself. There's the timestamp. You know, please do double check everything that I'm saying. But this is this is very crucial information provided by his testimony, okay? Because you and I and him we are all confronted with this same verse. We all have this verse in our Bible, right? So what was your reaction to it? That's my question that I would ask you. Because my reaction was that it, it mentions eternal life. That's the subject matter. That's what John 10 is talking about. It says that Christ will hold on. And I just assume that my hand is not greater than his hand. And because it's because he's holding on to my hand, it's his responsibility to do this, not my responsibility, right? It's not my responsibility to hold on to his hand. He's holding on to my hand so that no man can ever pluck them out, right? And there's no exceptions given in this passage. There, there is no exception. No man shall ever pluck them out of my hand. And he's answered his own question. It says nothing about me walking away, right? Well, that's the end of it for me. It says nothing about me walking away. But the, his reaction was, well... It doesn't say I can't walk away. And so what, what he's done is he has had to make his own exception based on what it doesn't say rather than just going on what it does say. Okay. Now, uh, just as a bit of verbal commentary, please don't misconstrue what I'm saying here as like I'm better than him because I'm better at decision making than him or you know I got saved and God answered my because I just know how to respond correctly you know please don't misunderstand this as you know me bragging about free will or something like that that's not the case this is not meant to sound like a brag I'm just trying to show you tangibly how the word of God has two different effects on two different people who were both asking this same prayer God show me the truth, right? And so, um, you know, what what what's fundamentally wrong here is the mindset, and, and it, you know, it's not my good decision making or my, you know, I didn't make good decisions before I got saved. That that's not. So please don't misunderstand this as a brag. I'm just trying to show you, you know, how how the word of God affects two people completely differently. That's what I'm trying to show you. And ultimately, what I'm trying to explain is then that his reaction to that verse is very troubling. Because he has essentially added his own exception, which the passage does not offer. And of course, you know, he, he would point to other passages in the Bible, such as John 15, to, to, to present his exceptions, right? But, but the problem is, here, here's the problem with the way that he's approaching John 10, is that John 15 or Hebrews 6 or John, Hebrews 10, 26 or other typical conditional security go-to passages, they don't mention the shepherd sheep illustration so you can't really take a passage that's about something completely different altogether and then invent invent some new type of sheep in john 10 that we can walk away from christ when john 10 offers no such concept and in my previous video on john 10 you know i do go into a lot of detail about what's wrong with that okay but you know we have two types of sheep those that are his and those that are not and those that are not it's because they don't believe in that it's as simple as that and of those that are his no man shall ever pluck them out of my hand so to invent a sheep that is christ and can walk away still based on a passage that has nothing to do with sheep that doesn't work you're, you're what you're doing is you're just finding excuses or you're just finding passages about something entirely different to make your own exception right and remember what i said in the previous slide he, he tried to justify it by saying my thought process was thinking thus and such but you see those two words there thought process therein lies the problem because if you think about it the bible commands us to repent well what does that mean change your mind change the way you think and so in his case it would have been profitable to repent of pontificating what John 10 doesn't say and just blindly believe what John 10 does say without trying to redefine it. Unfortunately, he didn't take that option. And so, you know, he's thinking, well, my thought process says it's, it says nothing about me walking away. 
well, yeah, you need to change the way you think. Childlike faith, right? Your thought process is the problem, not the solution. Now, it's hard to spot somebody like him as somebody who does not abide because he, he does know the Bible very well. And as far as he is concerned, he is somebody who is abiding in Christ's words, sayings and commandments. And it's only really when you dig a little deeper and really think carefully about how he establishes his doctrines and interprets the Bible, you can really see how he does not actually continue in Christ. Now, I'll give you some examples of just people who don't abide in Christ like him, okay? So, just to give you some examples, then, of people who abide versus people who don't abide in Christ's word. So, the Bible said, right, we have this verse, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? So, he who abides, a person who abides in Christ's words, would look at that verse and think, well, it mentions eternal life, that's the application. It's not talking about something else. It's not just talking about a Christian life. It's talking about eternal life, right? And the condition is believes in him. That's the condition, believing in him. Somebody who abides, that's how they react to that verse. Somebody who does not abide would say, well, what about all these works passages? But the thing is, in those works passages, eternal life is not the application, right? So we have this premise believe on him have everlasting life yeah but there's this passage about sinning no more yeah but where did it mention eternal life though in, in that conversation and so you see what they're doing here and, and that's tricky because they are going to the bible you know it's not like they're going to the world for those reactions but they're going to non-eternal life passages to redefine eternal life or they'll say well there's more to it than just believing and so what they have to do is add words in this verse that it doesn't say. They have to read this verse as saying, whosoever believes in him and proves his belief by his works should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, the problem is you're just making your own exceptions to that verse based on a passage that's not talking about eternal life. Okay, here's another one that they do it with. So, for by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, you're very familiar with it, I'm sure. So, he who abides in Christ's words would look at that Christ's words there and think, well, it mentions salvation. There it is saved and it's eternal salvation. It very, 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 very specifically says it's not of works. Why? For the very, very, very purpose that no man should boast, right? And it says it's by grace. Grace means God's unmerited favour. That's what that word means, right? So somebody who abides looks at that verse and thinks of it in those terms. Well, says it by grace says it's not of works so that's how we're saved now somebody who does not abide says but what about james saying we're justified by works and again they are going to the bible they're not going to the world for that answer which is why it's a tricky one but notice how i've put in the word saved there and crossed it out yeah and i've put the word justified because you see what they're doing there the bible says we're saved without works so, they say, well, what about James? It says it's justified by works. Yes, I can see it says it's justified by works. It doesn't say saved by works, though, does it? Ephesians says saved without works. It doesn't, it doesn't say justified. It says saved. Words matter, okay? Now, also somebody who does not abide would then go to the next verse in Ephesians after this, where it says we are called unto good works, that we, we should walk in them, right? But the problem is that verse doesn't change the fact that salvation is still without works, yeah, but the next verse says to do with yes, but it's still salvation's without works, though. It doesn't change that principle, okay? So salvation is without works. We've been called on two good works, but salvation is still without works. That's still the case, okay? And so you see how somebody who abides not just has to make these random exceptions to just cancel out verses, okay? Uh, and here's some more examples. So the Bible said, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which is, uh, gave them me, is greater than all. Look at that bit there, greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand, right? So somebody who abides in Christ's words would just think, well, it mentions eternal life. It's, it's there. It's right there. My hand is not greater than the father's hand because he's greater than all. There are no exceptions here, right? There's, there's absolutely no exceptions, no ifs, no buts. And the, this is the bit that people overlook, is that somebody who abides thinks, well, his sheep belong to him, okay? Anybody who knows the first thing about shepherding sheep knows that sheep are animals. They're not people with free will, okay? They are seen as property. They belong to the shepherd, okay? A property, his property, his sheep that belong to him 
cannot just walk away because that's not how shepherding works, okay? If you were a shepherd and you just let your sheep wander away, well, guess what? You're going to be out of a career very, very quickly, okay? Somebody who doesn't abide in Christ's words will just says, my free will, it says nothing about me walking away. Well, you've answered your own question, haven't you? It says nothing about him walking away, so let's just abide in Christ's words. Or they'll point to, well, Hebrew 6, they fell away. Yes, but where does it say they were saved onto life? Where does it mention sheep and shepherding? It doesn't. Simple as that. Okay. Um, and here's another one. Know that know, know you not that they which run the race run all, but one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain. Now, somebody who abides in Christ's words would look at that passage in its context and think, well, it doesn't mention Paul's own eternal life. Okay. Ephesians and Romans already told me that my salvation is a gift, not a prize. Notice I've crossed out the word prize there because it says it's a gift. Eternal life is not a competition between me and somebody else because in this in this race, if you read that passage, only one person win, wins the prize. Yeah, but we're, we're not competing with each other for, for eternal life. It's not we're not, we're not Jehovah's Witnesses believing in the hundred and forty four thousand. Okay, so therefore, somebody who abides in Christ's words would think. It's talking about something else, not about salvation, because salvation's a gift that says prize, and he's not, you know, they would just read the context and see what he's talking about. Somebody who doesn't abide in Christ's words would just say, It's talking about my salvation, based on nothing. You have to win the race to be saved, right? So I've already exposed what the problem was with that in another video. Or they'll say, stop digressing with those Romans, Ephesians passages when I'm trying to confront you with this, you know, eternal life, you know, about eternal life with this passage. Yeah, but you're confronting me with a passage that's not about eternal life. When I digress to Romans and Ephesians, I'm going to the eternal life passages. I'm going to the salvation passages. I'm going to the justification onto righteousness passages. But you see, when you talk about the eternal life passages... The he who doesn't abide wants to get you talking about this. Well, what about this passage? Well, really, if we're talking about eternal life and you bring up that passage, we should actually be saying, what about this passage? Because this is an eternal life passage. This one isn't. Okay. And so you can see the different reactions between the person who abides in Christ's words and the person who doesn't abide in Christ's words. Okay. Even though the person who doesn't abide is quoting Christ's words, ironically. And this is really... You know, this kind of illustrates to us then how false gospels work in a nutshell and really summarises John 15 in a salvific perspective for us. As I've spoken before on this channel many, many times, if we have to abide in Christ's love, his words, his commandments, according to John 14 and 15, then why do the most hardcore work salvation advocates who by the way they love to quote john 14 15 they love this passage why do they insist on changing the words and commandments that jesus actually gave because if, if we have to abide in commandments and it's all about abiding in his commandments and the work salvation crowd love to quote abiding in his commandments well why then are your commandments not aligning with christ's commandments because christ's commandment said whosoever believeth in me shall not perish but have everlasting life christ's commandment said believe on the lord jesus christ that thou shalt be saved christ's commandment said repent and believe the gospel notice that it doesn't say the three magical words of your sins in that verse right well these people that say you have to abide in his commandments they've changed the commandments they say surrender your life to christ to be saved well christ never said that they say repent of your sins to be saved well it doesn't say repent of your sins it just says repent or, you know, they say, my works, you know, it's all about their freaking works. Yeah, all those works passages that don't mention eternal life or have got nothing to do with salvation. Yeah, those ones. Or, you know, they say, you need to sorrow and weep over the state of your sin and fall on your knees at the foot of the cross and pour out your heart and deny yourself and take up your cross and run the race for the prize for everlasting life. Well, the thing is, half of that Christ didn't even command and the other half, again, nothing to do with eternal life or even, you know, in its applicable thing, nobody follows it for eternal life. So you see how the people who love to quote John 14, 15 are themselves in disobedience to John 14, 15 because they've changed Christ's commandments. So hopefully you can see that very clearly. So hopefully by now then, you're starting to reach a conclusion about what Jesus is intending on teaching in John 15. Too many people see John 15 through the lens of it being about the subject of salvation specifically and instructed to those who are already unequivocally saved 
And there are allegorical applications to Christians because Jesus is talking to his own disciples. And so Free Will Freddy sees it through the lens of continuing in the faith and salvation without walking away from it, while Chosen Charlie sees it through the lens of confirming if somebody really is saved. Um, but really, if, if we're talking about salvation specifically, then if anything, really, the, the application to John 15 is that what it really is, it's a litmus test for those who are or not saved or who will be saved or won't be saved as measured by those who continue in his words versus those who don't. And you might call this the journey leading up to salvation. OK, but, you know, as I said before, eternal life is not being directly mentioned as the subject here. Jesus is telling his disciples to continue in his words and his commandments, which is basically what, what he said, what he instructed, and his love. So, you know, what he has done for them and how he has treated them, right? So let's just have a recap of John 14 and 15. So to keep his words, the things that he said, well, salvifically, his words said to believe on him that we might have life. He didn't command us to surrender our life to, to be saved because before we got saved, we were already dead in sin. So how can you surrender your life if you're dead in sin? doesn't make any sense right G, you know in john 15 you the branch abide in him the vine well salvifically there is no salvation in any other jesus any other gospel or other message right there's one jesus one gospel continue in his love well salvifically he loved you by dying on the cross and rising again if christ is not risen then we have believed in vain if we deny him as the christ we deny his love right when he says his words must uh, remain in you, if you want him to do as you ask him to do, well, salvifically, how are you going to ask Jesus to show you the truth or give you eternal life if everything that he says pertaining to the subject, you have to add, yeah, but, or what if, or what about, and also this. Well, the, the thing is, you know, it's like this Epiusio guy. There's no point you asking God to show you the truth if when he shows you the truth, you go, yeah, but that says nothing about dot, dot, dot. It, it, it's a pointless prayer. You're not abiding in his words. And so you ask what you will, but it won't be done unto you because you're not abiding in his words, right? Um, and the disciples themselves were chosen that their fruit should remain. So salvifically, we know that we are described as chosen and elect. So if God chose us and that equates to being saved and we can't un we, we cannot undo God's purposes, then those that who, who those who don't abide and are cut off according to John fifteen six, they they don't lose salvation. They they failed election, that's what happened. And so if God chose their you know, God chose the disciples, their fruit should remain. And so God's elect, their fruit should remain. Otherwise you have to say that God's election is essentially a failure and again we're, we're bordering on blasphemy if we start accusing god's election of being a failure okay so although it's not in in of itself directly talking about salvation you can see that there are salvific applications to it and salvation certainly is a subset of what it's talking about because presumably if you don't abide in christ's words and christ's words include what we must do or what god must do for salvation it's still appropriate for the matter being discussed yeah but then perhaps you might wonder, well, well why tell the disciples this then? If, if they're chosen and they will continue anyway, what, what difference does it make? What, why tell them to abide and that a branch could be cut off? What, what difference does it make to the disciples? And that is a good question because perhaps what I uh, referred to, uh, what I have spoken about before, before, particularly in relation to John 6, will help us to understand two frames of reference. Now, obviously, I've focused on sort of my frame of reference, but there's how God sees the world and he knows the beginning from the end. And then obviously there's how man sees the world, and we do not have the foresight of something that will happen outside of, of clear prophecies. Okay. So so let, let's try and illustrate this with a chart chronologically. Okay, so we've got this conversation. This is time, this, this, this bar here. We've got the conversation in John 13 to 16. We've got the past, so everything that happened in the past, and obviously, you know, that we, we know what happened in the past. Just a little while, now this isn't to scale, but just a little while after this, we've got Jesus going to his death and then he's going to rise again. And then after that, he's going to see his disciples. And then after that, Jesus goes to the Father. Okay, so this this is the, the chronological time chart, if you will. So 
the disciples can already see behind them. They, they've already been with Jesus. They, they know what the Old Testament says. And in the future, the Holy Spirit is going to bring into remembrance the things that Jesus taught them anyway. Yeah. But they can't see ahead of them. At present, they are very sorrowful, as it says in John 16, 20. They don't yet grasp that their sorrow will be turned into joy. Jesus knows that they are chosen, but they must see him again after his resurrection to give them the full assurance in faith, okay? And then, so, after Jesus has left them, the disciples will need to keep watch for false teachers and faith deniers and traitors and cut-off vines. They need to know how to identify them, because remember, they failed to identify Judas, right? Now, from, from God's frame of reference... God already knows the end from the beginning. It was already confirmed that the disciples were chosen and ordained that their fruit should remain. God already sees all of this. But as for the disciples, they can't see this. They, they can't see ahead of them. Okay, And this is why Jesus has got to explain this stuff to him. Okay, So, so John 15, really, it, you know, when we start to conclude what we've, what we've studied, it, it's not teaching us that we can lose salvation. Rather, it's showing us the journey and the separation of people who will or won't abide and continue in Christ, okay? Because, you know, we, we won't know in all cases, and it, and it helps us to, you know, we can we can guess who really is or not saved, because obviously, you know, we see that the, the way that the word of God affects different people as the parable of the sower, you know, the different types of people that the seed lands on, you see how the word of God affects different people in different ways. To some it sprouts onto everlasting life, to others it doesn't. So, if a man does not abide in Christ, he cannot continue to be part of the vine that is Christ. He cannot love the brethren because the love of God does not abide in him. He cannot benefit from hearing Christ's words because Christ's words have seemingly no beneficial effect on him. You know, just as a vine, giving him water and nutrition, it doesn't cause him to bring forth fruit. He is a dead branch. And as a dead or diseased branch... He's only harmful to the rest of the tree. That's why he must be cut off. So he will be cut off. He will wither. He will be burned because he does not have life. Now, if he had life, as the abiding branches did, then feeding water and nutrition should have resulted in fruit. It did not. And the reason it did not is because there is something fundamentally wrong with the branch. It's dead or diseased, for example. It's not just lazy as it, you know, was working hard yesterday and it's become lazy today and it needs to try harder tomorrow that's not how this works okay that's not how growing fruit works and, f and following how the disciples interpreted this then we, we can see why john says in his epistle not to receive the company or wish god speed to somebody who does not abide in the doctrine of christ because you know didn't jesus tell john to love one another as i have loved you yes but this one another is very specific. It's the branches that do abide and are attached. John should not bid Godspeed or receive a, a discontinuing person. Otherwise, he's partaking in their evil deeds or, you know, their evil gospel. After all, such a person is a harm to the rest of the vine and it, it must be cut off. Because salvifically, uh, they are cut off from eternal life if they don't abide in the doctrines required for salvation, that you have to believe on him and that I should lose nothing, etc. Relationally, they should be cut off from true believers if they hold to different doctrines about who Christ is. You know, I, I don't want to have a joint prayer meeting, for example, with somebody who prays to Mary, right? I don't want to have a Bible study meeting with somebody who is a a heretic because the thing is we're not really going to be able to edify one another we're not going to be able to benefit from fellowship and so they they need to be cut off from the vine they they cannot abide with, with me on the on the vine right and uh, looking at our aforementioned examples of individuals or groups that, that did not abide in christ that the catholic and orthodox churches did not abide in christ because while they claim to be the church that, that christ founded They've altered his words, they've altered his sayings, they've altered his commandments. Something that Jesus commanded his disciples, including Peter, very specifically not to do if they are to abide. They don't abide in that, they disobey that teaching. Sarah Martin, unfortunately, did not continue in Christ's love because his love is that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. She eventually 
concluded that she is not a sinner and doesn't need saving. And I say that with a heavy heart, um, you know, because some people will say, well, why are you doing this about, you know, why not just try and reach out to her or pray for her? It was because if she won't acknowledge that she's a sinner, there's nothing I can do for her. I can't help her in any way. There is literally nothing I can do, right? But, you know, I'm not trying to be mean about it. I do say that with a heavy heart because as somebody who knows the Bible, you know, to me, it's tragic. Now, she won't see it that way. That's just the way that it is. Christ's words did not abide in Epiusi Unapologetics, or the ironically named Abide in the Word that he's renamed his channel to, because Christ's words told him, no man shall ever pluck them out of my hand. And his response was, well, that says nothing about dot, dot, dot. And so that, that's just what about her. And, he, and, it, and the thing is, I've exposed him doing this before. He constantly misappropriates Christ's commandments for different purposes than for which they were intended. And he does not keep Christ's commandments. So if he can ask God to show him the truth seven ways until Sunday, but if Christ's words don't abide in him, he has to modify or change or what about or misappropriate them, then really he, he does not meet the criteria to ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And so if you were wondering earlier, well, how can somebody possibly ask God to help show them the truth and God doesn't answer them that prayer? Well, I hope that kind of gives you an answer, okay? And it, you know, it's not God's fault, really. So, so let's conclude the study with a diagram illustration in summary of, of what Christ is really saying, okay? So we're, we're, we're abiding in Christ. We're attached to the vine. The husbandman, the father, has to inspect the branch. There's going to be, have to be a point in time where the, the husbandman inspects the branch to see whether it brings forth fruit or not. If it, if it does... He pur excuse me, he purges it, it brings forth more fruit. If it doesn't, he has to cut it off. It brings nothing. Okay, that there's there's an inspection time going on there. So he that believes on me should not perish but have everlasting life. This person meets the criteria for Christ's commitment that I should lose nothing. Christ will not let this one be plucked out of his hand. God has predestined him according to the his purposes. This is the person that continues. The person that doesn't continue, well, he was enlightened, he tasted, and then he fell away. It's impossible to renew him onto repentance, as Hebrews 6 says. He believed in vain, as 1 Corinthians 15. Whatever belief he had here was a pointless belief. It didn't amount to anything. It didn't amount to any fruit onto eternal life. He, If he does believe in Jesus, it's another Jesus. It's another gospel, as per 2 Corinthians 11. It's not, it's not the true vine. Uh, he did not produce fruit at all. The words of Jesus did not profit him onto the saving of his soul. It, it, the, the words of Jesus were just completely useless to him. It didn't profit him. And he, he does not meet the criteria for Christ to lose nothing. Christ is not obligated to keep this man in his hand because he, he doesn't meet the criteria. Okay. And, and as I said to you before, what, what we don't have in John 15 is an example of a branch that produces fruit for a season and then suddenly stops producing fran, fr, you know, fruit because the branch afterwards went bad or it's just too lazy. We, we cannot apply such a concept. And so if the, con, if the conditional security advocate wants to invent this third type of branch, well, the bottom line is they're not abiding in Christ's words because Christ's words gave us two types of branches – the one that abides and produces fruit and the one that doesn't abide and produces nothing. They're the two options. This branch that did produce fruit yesterday and doesn't today, that's not what Christ described. Christ didn't give us that example. If you come up with that example to justify conditional security, you are not abiding in Christ's words. It's as simple as that. Just as we also have, you know, he who believes and he who believes not. He who is saved and he who is condemned. Those who are his sheep and those who are not. He who walks in the light, he who walks in darkness. We don't have somebody going between the two. It's not there. The, we have two types of people. And so, to finish off, I promise we're getting towards the end now, because I've only got 17 slides left. I know it's been a long study. We must answer this ever-burning question. If it, if it doesn't automatically mean salvation, what does it actually mean to be a branch in Christ? Because superficially, it sounds like it doesn't have any real meaning other than being figurative and doesn't really represent anything. Didn't we see clear scriptures to, you know, near the beginning that various verses show that being in Christ equates to salvation? Now, we, we, the thing is, we must understand that 
John 15 is an illustration. You are not literally a piece of wood with leaves sticking out of a vine, okay? So being a branch in Christ in this illustration is not the same thing as being in Christ in a more dogmatic verse that's specifically about eternal life and is not using an illustration, okay? It's very important that you understand that. So given what, we, given what we've learned in our study, it's really not difficult to answer this question at all. The answer is very simple. We just stop and think about what we learned about plant growth and what abiding in the vine represents, particularly about Jesus' words abiding in you. And we can already really comprehend the answer, okay? Just as a vine provides nutrients and water to the branches, so Jesus, who is the vine, provides us his word, okay? Which it's the word that needs to abide in us. And he provides us his love, which we need to continue in, so that his joy will remain in us, right? That's, that's the end goal there. So, like fruit, a branch does not just suddenly appear, okay, it grows, it takes time to grow, the vine is feeding it the necessary nutrients and water to enable it to grow. So, stage one growth, stage two growth, you know, it takes time for this branch to grow, yeah? And the vine is constantly giving these nutrients and water from the ground that it needs to grow this branch, okay? If it's too early, a branch cannot grow fruit yet. The husbandman cannot cut it from the vine for being unfruitful because it's not fruiting season yet. It's too early to check, okay? As we saw earlier in this study, if there is something fundamentally wrong with the branch, it will not produce fruit. And not only will it not produce fruit, it cannot produce fruit, okay? As Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. A branch dead or diseased, no amount of nutrients or water can help it. It, it might have to be cut off because of the health of the rest of the tree or the plant, okay? On the other hand, if the branch remained healthy and received sufficient nutrients and water from the vine, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever why it, why it shouldn't produce fruit once it's in the proper season. The branch itself is fruitful, so the, the branch abided until the necessary season. It was confirmed that it was a good branch, and not only did it produce fruit, but if conditions were right, it grew an abundance of fruit, okay? So a branch in Christ is somebody who is receiving the word, and for a season at least, he may even be growing in the word and knowledge thereof as the branch grows. But for many, unfortunately, this won't amount to salvation. There will be an ultimatum eventually, okay? You know, Jesus said, after all, many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, few there be that find the narrow way to life. Many Christians will hear about different perspe salvation perspectives, but will never let go of some form of work salvation. Many Christians will fall into heretical groups and stay there, or, you know, they just believe it because they've always believed it. Uh, many Christians will fall away and stop believing in God. Many Christians will never, ever read the whole Bible. They will read bits of the Bible and hear bits in church, but there will be many biblical concepts that are just simply alien to them, uh, or they will reject them. Um, and so, you know, following that, you know, many Christians still hold on to worldly points of view about politics or sin or judgment in the house of God. And this doesn't in of itself make them unsafe, but it's it's often a reflection of them being devoid in the Holy Spirit. When you can show people things in the Bible, well, I don't agree with that. It, it, there's something fundamentally wrong there is that they're wrestling against the words of, of God. So as a side note, then, you might wonder, well, uh, what about non-Christians, you know, the atheists, the Hindus, the Muslims, etc.? Where, where do they fit in this pattern, then? But the thing is that there's, there's no clear indication that they are as relevant to John 15. Perhaps they're a bit more relevant in the parable of the sower, maybe, if, if anything. But this is, more, this is a more complicated category, because some of them will, will never hear any biblical truth to a useful degree. Some of them will hear it as outsiders rather than insiders, or their foreign ideas of, of various things will already plant anti-Christian ideas in them before they ever really know anything about Christ or what the Bible says. Now, is there an allegorical application? Sure, fine. But ultimately, Jesus is telling his closest disciples because they're going to encounter people in the ministry who seem like brethren for a season, who will seem to be growing spiritually for a while, but then for one reason or another will be cut off. But it, it will take a while before this is actually manifest. And in the case of Judas, it, it really wasn't until the time of his betrayal that this became manifest. And so th this is why the husbandman waits until a given season to check the fruit of the branch. For different people, this will manifest in different ways. So for some Christians going through the motions of fellowship and going to church and then departing from the faith 
is how it is manifest to the rest of us that they did not continue. For the disciples, false prophets didn't always arrive to the faith false. They participated in the true faith, learned from the disciples, gained more knowledge in the word, but then it, at a later period it was then made known that they would preach heresy or turn against the apostles or draw disciples after themselves when they had the means of doing so. For some Christians, they will examine different points of view about the Bible, but they may stick to one that they like the most, irrespective of whether it's actually true or not. Uh, some Christians will become so prideful in their own knowledge of the word or their own denominational traditions, albeit in their false doctrines, and the more knowledge they acquire, the less inclined they are to listen to anybody who preaches a contrary view to what they believe, because they just know the Bible so well. Uh, many people unfortunately are going to hear the word and before fruiting season they will grow in knowledge of the word but but never really be converted before cutting time essentially so if, if we consider the aforementioned examples of, of people who did not abide um you know sarah Marsden, she she was a branch in Christ to an extent. She participated in Christian fellowship. She read the Bible. She studied the Bible. She prayed. She tried to put her faith into action. But upon realising that she didn't agree with the concept of sin, of judgment, of salvation, she realised she didn't believe. And she now professes that she, by her own words, is much more fulfilled and thriving in life without God, uh, without being a Christian. So unfortunately, she was never saved because Christ did not rise again as far as she was concerned. If Christ didn't rise again, she has believed in vain. Um, and I already answered this question earlier, you know, why don't I reach out to her or try and win her over or something? It, honestly, it's because I don't have a faith strong enough to believe that I could convince her. Because if we re if somebody rejects stage one of the gospel, that you are a sinner, uh, there's not really anything more I could do with that, that kind of person. And, and I think there is an aspect of well of evangelism of not wasting your time just trying to bombard the same people over and over and over again. And, you know, even like the Bible says about heretics, a maximum of two admonitions, because there's a certain point where you keep bombarding people with stuff and they're not going to believe it. And actually, I had some dealing with somebody commenting on my channel the other day where he kept answering questions from a false premise. And when I said that his premise was false or showed that his premise was false, he just kept asking the same question as if I'd never answered it or, or as if his premise is already true. And it, there's just a point where you realise I'm wasting my time because no matter how I explain it, you're either not going to get it or even, even twisted what I said and, and changed what I actually said in his rebuttals. And so if, if you're going to do that, like I can't really engage with you and there's no point me trying to help you anymore. Um, again, Epiusi on apologetics, or the ironically named Abide in the Word now. He was a branch in Christ when he was studying the Word and questioning the doctrines that he previously believed, but he was never saved because according to his testimony, his sal he measured his salvation according to his works performance, and he continues to do to this day. And I'm not, I think now that he knows the Bible as well as he does, and the amount of material that he's done, and he's even said, I knew that I would dedicate myself to the teaching of, work, you know, doing works. I'm not convinced that no amount of evangelism, no amount of answering the scriptures that he constantly strawmans is ever going to get him saved. He has had m m rebuke from multiple uh, free grace believers. He tried asking questions like he did his silly Hebrews 5, 9 challenge or something, and plenty of people answered him. But all he did in response, he just strawman the people who tried to answer him. He made false claims about what free grace actually believes. He is given over to his another gospel, his another Jesus. The real Jesus said, no man shall ever pluck them out of his hand. He has to find excuses and exemptions by going to non-salvific passages. And so that, you know, I mean, he's welcome to prove me wrong. If he wants to get saved, he is welcome to prove me wrong at any time. And I will make a public apology. But until that happens, I'm not convinced he's ever going to be saved. He He's given over to this. He He's been cut off as far as I'm concerned. And, and of course we have biblical examples you know Judas Iscariot was with Christ for several years he was surrounded by Jesus closest and most zealous disciples he heard Christ's teachings firsthand I mean that's a privilege more than most other other men that have ever lived on the planet okay he had that amazing privilege not only did he remain in unbelief he willingly stayed for the purpose of being a traitor
Uh, the disciples in John 6 were branches in Christ for a season while they dedicated themselves to his teaching and followed him as he did his ministry and, and he gave them his teaching. But they didn't really believe as the 11 did. It just wasn't known in the sight of man until the events of John 6 when they were finally choked uh, on, on his teaching that, that they would not continue. But Jesus already foresaw this. And when a branch is cut off, it's it's withered, it's burned, and so this would suggest that there is virtually no hope for it after that point. And this is perhaps why Hebrews 6 says, if they are enlightened, if they have tasted, but then fall away, it is impossible to renew them onto repentance. Okay, And, and don't misunderstand this as being an age thing. You know, that uh, a Christian who's been unsaved for 20 years is unsalvageable. Sometimes, you know, for some people, it just takes a lot longer than other people for fruit to grow and to... to uh, to, to be made known but you know think about this though when, when was the last time a very well-known theologian or church minister or evangelist i'm talking about really well-known people like famous people you know your john MacArthur's of this world your, your john pipers and that can you ever imagine a well-known lordship teacher or something converting in the final hours of their life right can you ever imagine a conditional security street screamer like jesse morell or abide in the word ever changing their position and getting saved you can't really it's you know when was the last time that ever happened it's super rare that that ever happens and it's very unlikely that sarah martin will at this point ever become a christian again because studying the bible actually led her to rejecting the faith not accepting it and, and she is now it by her own words much more fulfilled in her non-christian life and so really the bible just has nothing to offer for her uh, really now this i know this sounds like i'm ending our study on a negative when i've been so adamant before that this passage is supposed to be an encouragement so you know perhaps you are wondering um uh, you know now i'm worried that what you know what if i don't abide in christ what if i end up being cut off well the thing is if, if you're asking this question i think it's kind of fair to say that you're not cut off you know, it's kind of like the people who ask, what if I've blasphemed the Spirit? Well, if you blaspheme the Spirit, you wouldn't be asking if you blaspheme the Spirit, probably. You've listened this far into the study, which means you're at least willing to listen. You're willing to hear these, you know, arguments presented from the Bible. Now, whether you end up agreeing with them or not is between you and God. I can't help you with that. But, you know, if you love Christ and you believe him in what he said, you are a branch that is growing and and the goal of this salvation series is to help you grow so that in time if, if you're not fully confident in christ you will reach that point you will bring forth fruit to the saving of your soul that hopefully one day you will get other people saved um you know christ spoke to his closest disciples and he did not leave them comfortless he solidified their faith when he rose again and we can know in hindsight that he defeated death and all you have to do is believe on him and trust what when he says that i am in the father and in, in the father in me and i should lose nothing you just have to believe him when he says it that's all he's asking you to do really and so yes those of us who are saved we we mourn when we see people who don't abide and, and fall away and it you know it breaks our heart inside but unfortunately that that is something that's between them and god they they've heard the word of truth they've rejected it so you know don't let that be you and, and god already foreknows those who would be saved he's already predestined them and chosen them and so yes there, there will be many who fall away but there will be many who don't too and, and regarding the branches who bear fruit god will receive his first fruits as he gathers his people onto himself and if you've been following my john series up to now john has set us up for everything we need to abide he has given us christ's words in the stories and the dialogues he recorded you know he recorded christ saying believe on me have everlasting life this is a simple introduction there is nothing complicated about this whatsoever he recorded in his gospel christ saying unto us i give unto them eternal life and i should lose nothing and i will in no wise cast out so believe him when he says it and stop making excuses as to why he might lose you or you might walk away just stop adding exceptions to the words that christ gave stop trying to cancel out christ's words about eternal life using passages that aren't talking about the subject so don't negate salvation passages with non-salvation passages with these books and what about is okay and so um, i'm going to conclude our study there because this study has been exceptionally long and you know kudos to those of you that have listened this far in it, it's been very mentally exhausting putting this material together because it's just such a difficult chapter and we've barely unpacked half of it i've not even finished the latter half of the chapter it's just such a complicated chapter and you know people might disagree with some of the stuff that i've said about this which is fine because again it, it's so cryptic in a way um 
so we haven't covered the latter half of this chapter. What I'm going to do is, though, um, there is more that I could have said about that in the middle of it, but I'm, I'm going to join that with chapter 16. So when I do a study on John chapter 16, I'll just do the latter half of 15 as well, because really that that part of the conversation really more belongs to John 16 anyway. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't quite re I wouldn't quite change the chapter number where the whoever did, made that decision did. So uh, that's just one of those things. But if you think there's something that I've missed, uh, please do let me know in the comments. Uh, this is such a complex chapter, so you know a bit of iron sharpening iron would would help me too. Uh, I'm not sure how long it would take, but you know, stay tuned for the latter half of chapter 15 and 16. 16 hopefully, in, in a few weeks, uh, you know, very soon. But I might have to put it on the back burner for a while because I want to start getting material done for um, a second documentary. So uh, you know, I'd like to prioritise that leading up to Christmas. And I'm just a bit busy with work at the moment as well. <laughs> 